Hey, Robert. Hello. All righty. So, so we're ready to go over Genesis? The uh, Epistle of Barnabas, it talks about how um, the, the, there were seven days of creation and that they correspond to 7,000 years of the age, uh, which is really an interesting statement because um, I think going back to Usher's chronology, for example, um, which again isn't canonical, it really isn't anything, but it's just a, it's just kind of a commonplace sort of, um, um, how should I say, timeline that's used to, uh, to determine when the date of creation was according to biblical logic. And again, what we talk about the things on the heavenly level, we're talking about things that are following a biblical logic, a kind of a internal logic that you can understand things in terms of symbols and in terms of um, uh, signs, uh, in terms of images, uh, in terms of basically templates that you can use to kind of unlock things and understand things on a higher level meaning. But it's an efficient way of, of transferring information across an age because the mystery is itself transmitted on two levels, one which is known and one which is unknown, one which is seen and one which is unseen, one which is out in the open, uh, has, a, has an earthly level, fleshly level, proximate meaning, but secretly underneath the skin of it, if you will, underneath the surface of it, because the heavenly level meaning is couched in the earthly terms. They're literally inherent in the earthly terms. So that when you speak on the earthly level, you're inherently speaking on the heavenly level. So when you speak about creation, for example, and you end up at the seventh day, if it is as Barnabas alleges that the seven days amount to seven years, then the seven, then the, the creation story should be carrying with it. The, the surface level meaning should have within it a higher level meaning um, that corresponds to the age because you end up on the seventh day. And according to Barnabas in the higher level understanding, you end up on in the seventh millennium, so to speak, in, in that particular day of rest, which is the which is interesting because that really jives with like what it says in the book of Revelation about there being a, a millennium, a, a time of a thousand years where we live in mm -hmm. with Christ. Right. And, and we, it's, discuss, it's, it says, you know, um, I, sorry to cut you off. I was reading, um, I was skimming through Barnabas as we were talking. And also I was looking for second Ezra where it talks about um, the, the amount of time that has already passed during Ezra's time. Um, when he's speaking about the rain and the mist and, and how it compares to the times. But in Barnabas 4.3, it says, The last offense is at hand concerning which the scripture speaketh as Enoch saith. For to this end the master hath cut the seasons and the days short, that his beloved might hasten and come to his inheritance. Um, and then it says, Barnabas 4.4, 4, And the prophet also speaketh on this wise, Ten reigns shall reign upon the earth, and after them shall arise another king who shall bring low three of the kings under one. And so you're speaking of Revelation, um, and then that seventh day, which is the Sabbath um, in in um, the spiritual sense. So go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, it's, it's very interesting how um, both he and uh, Jude uh, speak of the prophetic nature of that book. I mean, you have mm -hmm. a witness of it there with him. Um, like a lot of people that I've spoken with, Barnabas was really the turning point in my understanding uh, of how to understand things on a spiritual level. And so I keep returning to this book because Barnabas, I like to think of myself in, in, in some regards as Barnabas, not, not so much as a teacher, but as a student. You know, and he was somebody who was obviously reading the Didache. He quotes that. He's obviously reading the book of Enoch. He quotes that as, as scripture, as prophecy, multiple times. Um, he, he, he is, uh, he's, a uh, he's obviously has read about the dietary laws in the epistle of Aristeas, which you can find in the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. Um, all of that stuff he talks about, about the animals and stuff, he's gotten these things from books. And so he's expositing out of these books. So we kind of are able to look at him as sort of like, um, something we should strive to emulate if we want to, to have his level of understanding. We need to be reading these books. We need to be taking them on the level of prophecy, and we need to be taking them for what they are. They, they are vehicles by which a, a heavenly understanding is revealed in time. 
So, I mean, and, and that's what the, the, and again, I can't stress this enough. The, the heavenly level is inherent in the earthly level. In other words, you, you, you have the same words, but if the, if the words denote certain things beyond themselves, uh, you have to look for a couple things. They have to be consistent. They have to be uh, across the board. Um, the gospel of truth, for example, goes on and on and on and on and on about the unitary thought. The idea that everything is understood with a unitary understanding. That, in other words, if it's true, it, it is according to a heavenly language. It is according to the unlocking of keys. Uh, Barnabas spends a, a tremendous amount of time um, explaining, you know, th what the dietary laws are, for example, uh, what the what is coming about. You know that the days. Uh, of the wicked one are at hand. He's talking about the falling away, so to speak, of the age. Um, and you know, it, this was the this was the understanding of the initiates of the early church. And the thing was, and and, and the thing about it is, they understood by means of the spirit. When uh, by means of the spirit, of course, as well as their understanding. I mean, you know, you speak of somebody like Apollos, who was mighty in the scriptures, and therefore, because he had that knowledge or whatever, when his spirit came alive, due to his understanding of these things, he was a very powerful teacher, because he's very primed, you know, to teach, and, you know, his insights could stretch, you know, and, and same thing with uh, Barnabas. Um, and, and to some extent, we see also in the, in the New Testament, we see Paul uh, quoting out of the life of Adam and Eve. We see Peter quoting out of the story of Ahikar. We see Jude quoting out of the, uh, the, uh, the, the book of Enoch, as well as the assumption of Moses, or so it is thought. Um, and there, there are a great many other examples. You see the teachings of Jesus. You see many allusions to things in, in, the, in the book of Enoch. Uh, for example, the rich man and Lazarus, for example, when they are in this uh, the place of waiting, when he is in Abraham's bosom, uh, you know you see that same story about the fountain of water and and, and all that the the divisions that are made for people, and you see that he's a, he's affirming these things. Uh, he's affirming the book of Maccabees uh, when he talks about how he's observing the Hanukkah festival, as if to say that miracle did happen. You know what I'm saying? So, and that's attested to in, in Second Mac or the Maccabees, and also in the. Um, the uh in hebrews chapter 11 the chapter of faith right it's very interesting how and and this is where i think i think god has thought everything through in such a way that there's an accuracy to it and a precision to it that is mathematical that is algebraic that is a literary masterpiece of the transference of uh information across an age uh with such stealth and with such with such a with with such an exactitude in, in terms of the way in which it, that that it 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 bypasses the thinking of the carnal mind and right. so and so when you make the heavenly the, the heavenly level inherent in the fleshly level if the mind is inherently directed downwards towards the fleshly level if they're constantly reifying solidifying uh you know the spiritual into the physical where they insist on actual days and when they when they insist on you know when when the bible speaks of a day as, as a thousand years and a thousand years or as a day you know which is again barnabas's you know premise for saying that on the seventh day represents the seventh millennium and stuff um but anyway just to make a short story long um, no, no, you know, that, that's that it's kind of the it's this is just setting the stage for how to think and how to approach these things. Because well, well, like like you had mentioned a, a moment ago, is I always wondered why Jesus never answered certain questions the way that they were asked. And the way that you put it just now was, or well, you've put it in your work, but I've heard you say it this way, is that they were asking the wrong question. Because, so he almost like, like bypassed their question and went straight to the answer because they were asking in a fleshly way when they should have asked in a spiritual heavenly way, which seemingly when he spoke those things to them it was before or sometimes seems like it was before the transition where peter then was like preaching with john so like before the tomb where he realized jesus was out of the tomb so he had already come back from the dead so that's his spiritual nature i know i'm going ahead of myself but and this might be hard to understand what i'm saying but hopefully you understand what i'm saying but um in barnabas 8 um 8 
five, eight, six, and eight, seven, it says, uh, then there is the placing of the wool on the tree. This means that the kingdom of Jesus is on the cross and that they who set their hope on him shall live forever. And why is there wool and hyssop at the same time? Because in his kingdom, there shall be evil and foul days in which we shall be saved. For he who suffers pain in the flesh is healed through the foulness of the hyssop. So talking about, um, and then in seven, now to us, indeed, it is manifest. So he's saying to us, we understand these things, but it says that these things so befell for this reason, but to them they were dark because they heard not the voice of the Lord. So there are certain things that were in a, a, a heavenly nature for us to understand, but to them it was dark because they couldn't see the light. So like you teach in the Paul teachings that there are certain things that are have an earthly th meaning and a heavenly meaning and to them it was only earthly that's what the food laws were to them was an earthly thing so they kept the food laws but to us it's a spiritual thing just like the sabbath is a spiritual thing not a day that we're supposed you know celebrate or whatever you know just in that sense that so if that makes sense yeah it, it the the idea of the voice like what we were what he was just mentioning the voice mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. it's when you hear with your spiritual ears you 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 if you see everything taking place on the level of the flesh like in other words everything is at face value no no you know what i'm saying it's just stories it's just fairy tales i think this is how a lot of uh, unbelievers and a lot of atheists and probably a lot of christians as well they take things at face value. They go looking for parables here and there. They go looking for visions here and there. They go looking for interpretations here and there. They know that these literary features exist, but they don't, they don't quite get that the whole thing is that. Like, in other words, from the beginning to the end, it's like there's this and then there's this, right? And hearing that voice and lifting up your eyes, like mm -hmm. th those are the kinds of things that, 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 clue us into you know uh the idea that there is a heavenly level meaning oh my goodness robert i apologize to cut you off again but the it, the verse right after that i should have read it because this is what it says barnabas 9 1 it's like the answer furthermore he saith concerning the ears how that it is our heart which he circumcised the Lord saith to the prophet, with the hearing of the ears, they listen to me. And again, he saith, they that are afar off shall hear with their ears and shall perceive what I have done and be circumcised in your hearts, saith the Lord. So it's the, the fact that you can hear with, with both ears, that you can hear spiritually, that's the circumcision. And that's what Abraham did in recognition of Christ I mean, in the future. It, it, it's happening. You're, you're hearing right. it. I'm hearing it. The people mm -hmm. who understand this language are hearing it we know, we know in our hearts, we see it with our eyes, we hear it with our spiritual ears, you know what I'm saying, we, we, we get it, and the thing, and, and, and that's the reassurance, is that every, un, everybody understands with the same eyes and the same ears, there, there is a common language and a commonality, sometimes they're given keys, and sometimes they're by insight, uh, Barnabas then goes on to explain, um, talking about you know, I, I've, I've gone and explained things up to, to this to this point, right? And he said, were I to explain to you about things present or things to come, as if he could explain to us about things present or things mm -hmm. to come, he said, you would not understand them. Because the whole time he's up here, he's been expounding parables, expounding parables, expounding parables, expounding parables, right? That's what mm -hmm. he's been doing, right? And then he reaches this sort of... Uh, this sort of pivot where he starts talking about the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness and all that. And he transitions into a different kind of teaching. But before he does that, he takes a moment to pause and say, listen, if I were to teach you, you know, up, up to thus far, I've taught you, you know, sufficiently, I hope. And then he says, but, you know, if, if I were to teach, to speak to you of things present or things to come, right, you would not understand them because they are put in parables. So mm -hmm. in other words, the, the parables that are spoken by the early Christians are about things then present and things to come. So you keep the mystery from people, the carnally minded, the wicked, right, by, 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 by clothing them, so to speak, in fleshly terminology, uh, by concealing them. Like in the Gospel of Thomas, it says, you know, um, um woe to the soul that depend upon the uh the flesh and woe to the flesh that or, no no wait he, he talks about poverty let me let me start with that he talks mm -hmm. about poverty what is the poverty 
And what is the wealth? Remember, there's this whole duality. It, it, it exists in Gnosticism. It exists in Christianity. Uh, you know, uh, you're talking about something like that may be a matter of degree and not mm-hmm. a matter of kind. Um, in, the, in the Bible, it talks about, you know, if the light within you is single, you know what I'm saying? Um, then, you know, and, and you can light up the whole world. You know, just because it says something once or twice or three times over here, and 15 or 20 times over here doesn't mean that that book really leans in a different direction. It just means that it's expounding on these things and that right. there, there are different sources that you can get these same teachings from to a greater extent. And if you have the spiritual eyes to see and you have the spiritual ears to hear, right? Um, because um, because he says that, that um, if, the, if the flesh came into being because of the spirit in other words if things were couched in earthly terms for the sake of uh, the preservation in other words of that meaning for the the eventual re-revelation of that right Mm -hmm. he said that it is a marvel but if the spirit came into being because of the flesh it is a marvel of marvels Right. right he says and yet i i am astounded at how this wealth the spiritual understanding has made its way into this poverty <laughs> in this <laughs> yeah. poverty, which yeah. is the fleshly level. See what I'm right. saying? He's expounding yeah. something about the heavens and the earth. He's expounding about the heavenly and the earthly. And anyway, so I kind of just wanted to touch base with a few of those points before diving into, into Genesis because, well, I, I know a few, sorry to uh, interrupt once more, but um, I, I know a few people that watch my show and they watch your show and they're, they've um, dived into your uh, Paul series. And I mm-hmm. recommended that because when you learn about Paul, I was just thinking about it this morning on, on the way to work. Paul teaches that the fact that Paul is a prisoner because he's a spiritual prisoner and has been for the past 2000 years because people don't understand his teachings. So when he says like Jesus, if that's the lower level, when he says Christ, that's the higher level meaning. So you, if you go back and read all of Paul's work, you can literally just watch it happen. It, it, it unfolds just that simply. When he says Jesus Christ is talking about the earthly couch and the like heavenly things, and it's like back and forth, back and forth. And you can see him talking about the higher level meaning. And same thing you just talked about with Barnabas is that he's saying, well, um, you know, I, I could teach you that stuff now the stuff that comes in the future, but it's, it's almost like it needs to be preserved. That's why he just went yeah, on to something else. Right. He it, went on to something else. So that that's right. He, he wanted, I don't, I don't like to use the word conceal. I like to use the word mm-hmm. preserve or mm-hmm. to protect or exactly. to safeguard you're, you're right. something. Um, mm-hmm. What, what literally happened was that, was that the higher level teaching was really only given to certain initiates. Which it says and, in Second Ezra, that's that's what he was commanded to do was to give it the the like you said the concept of the twenty four is a dead concept because he said this one um, or whatever give give to like there's twenty four books you can give to them but the rest is for the wise like the certain ones were for the wise and the unwise alike but then the rest of it was for the wise only to look at and that's what he gave to Ezra or whatever and then you said something to that effect is that. Um, there was the 24 elders that are bowing before the lamb or whatever at the end that, that he only, he could read the book. Like it has to do with the 24 elders at the end of time. Uh, it's, it, you know, there's all the codes in the Bible, but I won't get into that right now, but. Yeah. And, to, and, and in the gospel of Com- Thomas, it reaffirms the idea of the 24, 24. Mm-hmm. And, and there's just, there's different numerations, but generally when the 24 are spoken of, it has to do with the way in which the, the Jews categorize their their books and and certain yeah. books were put together like Ezra and Nehemiah and you know what and I'm he saying? said you were speaking you're speaking of the dead he said you're speaking of the dead when the living one is in your presence so the, the what they were talking about was a dead concept because they were speaking of the 24 but really there's the the living here's, concept. here's is, the thing if, if anybody wants to get eyes to see and ears to hear like really fast like in shorter order like in 15 minutes you know what I'm saying <laughs> to get spiritual eyes no no um, there's there's a couple of things. Number one, there is always the upper and there is the lower, and it's couched in different ways. Because see, look, there is the better and there is the worse. Make a, make a list of things which are the better and make a list of things which are the worse. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, to have knowledge is better than to not have knowledge, right? Uh, mm-hmm. To uh, uh, to to have wealth, spiritual wealth, is better. Um, than to have 
spiritual poverty, so to speak. So when you read when you read something like the Gospel of Thomas, there's a lot of light and there's a lot of darkness all throughout the New Testament and throughout all of the scriptures. I mean, it's ubiquitous. The idea that that um, that that being of the day is being of the understanding of being of the spirit, right? To be of the night is to be of the darkness, is to be part of the kingdom of darkness. It's through, it just absolutely, the, the scriptures absolutely ooze with that kind of uh, uh, imagery and that kind of uh, teaching. You know, uh, walk as if you were in the day and not in the night, because we are children of the day and not children of the night. You know, we don't, oh, wait, and, oh, and that, the that's associations, what, you know. Let me read, Bar let me read Barnabas 11.4 in that respect. Um, uh, Robert, and again, the prophet saith, I will go before thee and level mountains and crush gates of brass, which is what he did in Nicodemus when he went down to the underworld and, and conquered the underworld and break in pieces, bolts of iron. And I will give thee treasures dark concealed unseen that they may know that I am the Lord God. So these are those things, those teachings that are, they are treasures that that is what the treasures are spoken of is those those spiritual treasures that he has stored up for us in the end times, which Enoch talks about for the elect. So go, go ahead, sir. Well, this is basically leading us to um, the uh, seventh day of creation, having some kind of parallel with the seventh millennium and just how do we get there? And just what does this mean? And what does all this, what does all this symbolism mean? Um, because again, it's important to kind of understand that if any of the Bible is written on a symbolic language, um, then, you know, the whole Bible needs to be understood as carrying with it that, that secondary uh, language, that, that second level. And I think that the book of Genesis is often understood in such a straightforward manner by people that they don't really make the connections that they should be making. And so I thought it might would do to just start pointing some of these things out. Uh, again, not as like, Again, I hate to sound like Barnabas, but again, not like as a teacher, but as like a fellow student looking at this stuff, trying to make sense of it because, you know, it, it, it's supposed to hang together. It's supposed to make sense. And again, if the rules work here, they should work everywhere. And so you have to go and apply the same teachings. Like what we were talking about being children of the day, children of the night, you know, uh, the higher level meaning, the lower level meaning always always there's this this other meaning carried with whatever it is that you're reading um almost without fail i, I can't I, I i can't pretend to understand every single bit of this that's why there's so many people out there that we've all got each other's back and that iron sharp and it's iron and that you know this is this is about making progress in these areas but again reading from the king james it talks about in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth um, the idea is that this whole this whole thing um, with, uh, for example, the parallel in John. If you go to the uh, Epistle of John, or I'm mean, sorry, the Gospel of John, and you read, there's a similar uh, creation story, sort of told. But in this connection, it talks about the word, the logos, right, which is the proper understanding of the word, the true meaning, if you will, of the word. So the idea is that not exactly to conflate the two ideas or the, to conflate, the two, they're not really relatable in the sense that you could just splice them together, but they, they agree with each other in the sense that one over here is talking about the word, the logos, right? So the other one can't be entirely divorced from that. There, there has to be something there. There has to be some kind of connection, some kind of insight. And to me, that's what kind of informs what I'm about to, to talk about. The idea is that, that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you see this in terms of having to do with the logos or the word of God, right? You can begin to see that he's talking about in the beginning or in the first place, God created the heavenly and the earthly understanding if you will of the logos right that they that there 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 is it's sort of um meta here you're talking about the same thing but you're talking about one in very concrete terms and one in very abstract terms so that the way that they relate to one another 
like I said before, is that the one kind of informs the other. You know, we're talking about God's word here in terms of of his overall um, achievement, if you will, of the understanding of the logos or mm -hmm. the, the unfolding, if you will, of the logo. So it isn't as if the two are separate creations or there, it isn't as if the two are, are unrelated. It's as if you were talking about this in terms of its facets and its nuances rather than just, a, you know, um, you, you see what I'm saying? So in other words, if there is in the beginning, the heavenly and the earthly understanding, you can begin to see um, where this leads. Like when you lead into verse two, for example, and it says in the earth was without form uh, and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the, the face of the waters. OK, there's a lot of there's a lot of what we understand to be keys that are that are that are inherent in that sentence. Like we understand the water, the water of the word. Right. Um, when we when we speak of waters, we speak and we speak of scriptures. You know, um, when we speak of um, the earth, we're also speaking about the earthly level understanding or understanding things in earthly terms. When we speak about the heavens, we're understanding things in terms of the heavenly meaning. When we understand darkness, we're, we're understanding about the kingdom of darkness and the state of, of death, the state of sleep the state of torpor, the state of, you know, the, the valley, if you will, as opposed to a mountain, you know what I'm saying? There's this whole, there's this whole category of things below. There's this whole category, uh, a whole spectrum, if you will, of things below. The things that, that pertain to the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And again, that's touching back on what Barnabas was teaching us out of the Didache, was that, you know, he was affirming that and, you know, reinforcing that, you know, and, and the, the rules in w that he gives, for example, in the latter part of the book had to do with the light and the darkness, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, the children of light, the children of darkness, the way of light, the way of darkness. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, this, it's this whole light and darkness theme. And so all you're doing is going through Genesis and being consistent with that and being consistent with that having to do with the heavenly and the earthly and the, um, the flesh and the spirit. So when he says the earth was without form, it means that there is this, this whole unfolding of the earthly age, so to speak, that has not yet happened. There, it, was, it was then formless because he's talking about the whole earthly age, the earthly meaning, the earthly level. Paul calls this the mystery of iniquity. He talks about how it's going to be an unfolding of things. Um, because of the necessity of the battle between good and evil in order for good to truly triumph it needs to actually go about the business of conquering evil you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying and that's yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's barnabas I, I have i just hit control find on barnabas and it's it took me to a couple that mentioned light but specifically barnabas 18 1 but let us pass on to another lesson in teaching. There are two ways of teaching and of power and one of light and the other of darkness. And there's a great difference between the two ways for on the one are stationed the light giving angels of God and on the other are the angels of Satan, 18 two and the other, and the one is the Lord from all eternity and unto all eternity. Whereas the other is Lord of the season of iniquity that is now. And then 19 one says this then is the way of light. If anyone desiring to travel on the way to his appointed place would be zealous in his works, the knowledge then which is given to us whereby we may walk therein as it is as follows and then he goes into the teaching sorry go ahead well no and and, and this is what i'm saying because exactly so it's like when you read the earth it's the earthly level meaning without form in other words it has not it, it has not yet unfolded so you will understand its form in due time because it's the whole the whole run of the age so to speak the whole unfolding of the mystery of iniquity the whole mm -hmm. the whole fact that the heavenly that is couched in the earthly depends upon the earthly kind of running its course and the prophecies that are within the scriptures coming about if you will under the noses of humanity uh throughout this this entire six thousand year period um and so how does it how does it manifest well what this is is a series of uh of enlightenments a series of um 
of um, revelations, if you will, of, um, you know, a little bit like revelation in the seven churches, how it's a progression for each church leads to the next church leads to the next church. You know what I'm saying? And then yeah. uh, you, you see how finally you see the open door in the sixth church. Um, and then you see the the open door in the seventh church. You know what I'm saying? Because you, you're yeah. going through that door from this age to the next one. You know what I'm saying? And only, one, and only one of them had their crowns already, which was like the Philadelphia or whatever. They, you know what I'm saying? But talking. there's a connection yeah, yeah. between each one of those little things right, and because right. it's a progression of the church. Well, this is a progression of the age, but it's but when we talk about light and we talk about darkness here, we're talking about, in a sense, the kingdom of light or the 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 way it all hangs together. Because, again, you were talking about Barnabas. Again, that's from the Didache. Uh, the, it's the original teaching of the 12 apostles. You know, the idea is that that there is a heavenly and there's an earthly. And so Genesis is really just the beginning of all of that. The genesis, if you will, of that whole line of thinking. That there is an earthly way of reading the scriptures and there is a heavenly way of reading the scriptures. And so in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he's talking about the earthly versus the heavenly. Um, and again, it was void. That means that it... it it led to it led to emptiness. It led to um, meaninglessness, so to speak. You know, and you could see, like in our age, for example, if you just want to look at the whole kingdom of darkness from beginning to end. I mean, apart from the fact, I mean, a lot of it's been good. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, there's a lot of love and there's a lot of you know whatever in between. But by and large, and you're talking about who has the reins, if you will, of the world. It's all been evil. And, you know, it, it boils down to um, deception and war. Um, well, it says, that, it says this real quick um, in 2 Ezra 14, 19. May I speak in your presence, Lord? I replied, I am to depart by your command after giving warning to those of my people who are now alive. But who will give warning to those born hereafter? The world is shrouded in darkness and its inhabitants are without light. So he's asking God, like, what, how, who's going to teach these people when I'm gone? If you're, tell, you know. And so this is what we're talking about right now is fulfilling that it's us people like us doing this work. So yeah, and now. it was the people who left this mystery for us. Like like Barnabas is very clear about the fact that that he's leaving things that inform us about the things that were then present and that mm -hmm. things that were then to come in the form of parables. So that if you understand the parables, that's exactly what you should see. You should it, it should sweep away the mystery of the early church. And it should mm -hmm. sweep away the, the, away the mystery of the inner intervening age. That's and what that's, the process of understanding should show you. And that's what indeed that's, it does show you. Barnabas 3, 4, then shall thy light break forth in the morning and thy healing shall arise quickly and righteousness shall go forth before thy face and the glory of God shall environ thee. So that's what we're talking about as well is, is the light will break forth and you will understand and you your mind won't be in that darkness anymore. So that's the metaphoric right. sense of it. Yeah. So again, so when Genesis 2 talks about darkness and, and when you talk about the light, you know, that comes up or whatever, it's spiritual darkness and spiritual uh, light. The darkness was upon the face or surface level understanding of the deep or the depths, if you will, of the waters, which are the scriptures, in other words. And the spirit of God uh, moved upon the face of the waters. OK, so in other words, when you see the face, you're talking about the surface, the superficial aspects of it. Right. So that's sort of the fleshly aspect of it. But there's a depth to it. And the spirit, once it acts upon that surface level, right then um you see what i'm saying then actually you begin to see the heavenly meaning that's couched in it but again you got to kind of let it unfold and god said let there be a light a heavenly level understanding and there was a light there was a heavenly level understanding and it says and god saw the light the heavenly level understanding in other words as it pertains to the scriptures again in the beginning was the word right in the beginning was the heaven and the earth therefore when you combine those two things and you see the two as acting in tandem with one another, it's the heavenly and, and earthly understanding of the word, right? In other words, our heavenly earth, just like, just like Jesus would be. And again, I use these as commonplace terms for people out there. Uh, I know some of you find that offensive, but the idea is that, you know, I'm, I'm talking not just to the choir. I'm trying to reach out to people that, that otherwise might 
you know, not under, you know, not know. But it's it, it it's a very convenient way of of making that distinction because, like you said earlier, if you if you read the Understanding Paul series, you listen to it. I mean, you get you begin to understand the idea that that his name Jesus or Yeshua uh, was given to him at a circumcision, right? And the circumcision has to do with the flesh, mm-hmm. right? The removal of the flesh. It says that he was circumcised and they called his name Jesus, right? So th- that has to do with his fleshly aspect, him and the flesh. Him as a man, him walking around from point A to point B, eating, drinking, whatever he did, you know what I'm saying, that that we know because, you know, he was pure bodily. And so that, that name corresponds to the fleshly level. See, it's just the same thing, the heavenly and the earthly, the fleshly uh, and the spiritual, that which is above, that which is below. And it, it permeates here. Um, so, again... The Christ level, like, again, you know, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. In other words, living means understanding the scriptures. Dead means not understanding the scriptures. You're in the dead letter. When you hear this voice, you come alive. When you hear this secret language, in other words, you come alive, right? This is, this is the, it, the, the knowledge, right? When you know that you know that you know that you know. It's predictive. Uh, it's universal. It works across the board. You know what something's going to say what, about what somebody's going to say before they even say it because you're thinking in those terms and you get it. You know, you're following the logic, right? And you know when you know. Um, and so, again, he divided, uh, he saw the light and saw that it was good. Or, in other words, saw to it that it ended up good, that it ended up right, in other words. And God divided the light from the darkness. That is to say, that's the whole, that's the whole point at the end of time. When Babylon falls, and I think we're starting to see this because people are starting to see through the cracks and they're starting to, to question things and probably more so than ever because everybody in every corner of the world kind of can talk to each other. I mean, you kind of have to dip, dodge and dive to do it, you know what I'm saying, sometimes because you can't be open about it. But people are beginning to talk about things in a biblical sense, understanding that this entire this entire kingdom of darkness or whatever has some vulnerabilities, has some cracks, you know what I'm saying? And with us being able to shine the light on the truth, you know what I'm saying? That might just be enough for us to reach a critical mass. That might be just enough for us to be able to, how shall we say, you know, help it to fall uh, uh, under its own falseness, under its own, um, its own uh, evil, under its own darkness. So, well, so it, start, it starts, what you're talking about, is, if anybody cares to read it in their own free time, um, in my opinion, what you just said, in the, cat, the thing, the, the catalyst or whatever it is that changes the way things are now to a point where people will actually stop and listen, in my opinion, is 2 Ezra 15, the prophecies of doom, where Jesus says to Ezra that he will, my people are being led to the slaughter like sheep. I will no longer allow them to remain in Egypt, which you said Egypt is a code word for like Sodom and Egypt, like that place where Jesus was crucified, like Israel, but it's like a spiritual place though. It's not like a physical place or whatever. So again, using the keys, but will use all my power to rescue them. I will strike the Egyptians with plagues as I did before and destroy their whole land. So how could, how could God save his people again? In Egypt, if they're really not in Egypt anymore, like it was in Moses' time, in my opinion, I'm, that maybe it's America, Mystery Babylon or whatever, and I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm just saying it's very possible that the catalyst that you've been talking about all this time is right there in, in that, where all the well, people of the world are like stuck in this thing where they can't get out of it, and Jesus is going to make a way and like, lead them out of that mindset or something. I don't know. I, I try to avoid particulars in a lot of respects. Um, right. I know. I, I, know, I know. I think it's a universal thing. When you talk about you are from above, you are from the heavenly Jerusalem, right? As mm-hmm. contrasted with Jerusalem, which is below, like what Paul does, right? I mean, he, he's not strictly talking about only in Jerusalem. Like once you step foot outside of Jerusalem, everything's all wonderful. You know what I'm saying? Like right, it's not, right, right, right. It's not restricted <laughs> to some particular time or place yep. or individual. It, it's a, it's a, it's again, it's a very general kind of thing. Like the light is something you have and I had and they have, you know what I'm saying? And, and it, 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 you know, it, it's not confined to any time or place. Truth is just so can like I, that. Can, can I just ask you one question, Robert? And we don't have to go. I don't want to go into this. I just, I was always curious about this one thing. I never got to ask you. It, it, I know you say that we're seeing the writing on the wall and stuff like that and all this stuff. And it, you, But you've studied Enoch so much and you've studied all this material so much. 
honestly, what do you think it would take for this stuff to get out there in critical mass? You know, you know what I mean? I mean, you don't have to go over it. I'm just curious. Like, what do you think it would take? I'm just curious, like in your, in your thought process. You know? I think it would take, I, I don't know if, if I knew what would get it over on people, I, I you know, I, I don't know that I can answer that question. I know that it's going to happen in God's timing, that it's all, it's all there, that if, if everything has come to pass, like even again, Barnabas talks about this, when you see everything come to pass line by line, exactly as it is written, right? Right, right. It's both, as, it's both in terms of its events, but it's also a function of your seeing. Like, in mm -hmm. other words, it, 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 when he says, when you see these things, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's very important that it's your you're seeing it, you know what I'm saying. I, I think I'm seeing it, and I think you're seeing it, and I think that it's right. so it's so obvious and in your face that it can be explained. But ask yourself what John the Baptist was doing. He was a voice crying out in the wilderness, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it was the same thing with Jesus. You know, he would go around from place to place, but people went to hear the message. And people went to hear the truth and people went to be healed and people went to be filled and people went to, you know, what I'm saying to, to, to be baptized. You know what I'm saying? People had right. that motivation in their heart and everybody had their own motivation for coming. People were in expectation of it. People were, you know, and you think about what the climate was back then. And because right. as before, bad, yeah. so again, as right. above, so below, as in heaven, so on earth, in other words. Right. Like, Right, I agree. So, Fair. so in other words, it was pretty bad back then because the Romans took over Israel at the time, or, and it was pretty bad, and everybody well, thought it's it was gonna... because when people are fat and happy, he even talks about this in the Laodiceans. Remember Laodiceans being the last church. He said, "Listen, I placed before you an open door," and P and Jesus talks about this metaphorically. I am the door, right? You know what I'm yeah. saying? So, in other words, when he's saying, "Look, I'm placing before you the logos, and it's open," that means you can understand it, right? right. What so did he that's, say that's, about that's the Laodiceans? If you want to that, particularize and just say, well, if I don't want to say America per se, but let's just say right, right, winners, right. let's just say in this kingdom of Babylon, there are winners and losers. There, yeah. there is the West and there is the East, so to speak. You right. know, there there is the free world, right? And there is the third world or whatever. You know what I'm saying? If you want to break well, it's it, a, it, says, it says in the Bible, and especially in Revelation, that the rest of the world has partaken in the sins of whatever Babylon is. So essentially the entire world is committing these sins altogether. So regardless of who Egypt is of a country or whatever, everybody's partaking in these evil things. So regardless, it doesn't matter what the country is essentially because everybody's doing the bad stuff. So it's like, you know, uh, go ahead, sir. Oh, well, anyway, but the idea is that, is that, the riches it says in revelation you know the riches have to be taken away from you you see what i'm right. saying that, that, no that's what i say all the time is that once you shut, shut everybody's tvs off and and there there there's nothing for them to do and there's all this calamity going on they're going to be trying to find jesus because that's what happened when jesus was there all the people I, were sick I, and dying and unhappy and you know so i, I see it happening with for example our freedoms our standard of living, and again, I don't want to be a doomer because I'm really not a doomer per se, but you got to be cautious. You're living in a world where if something happened to the currency, what would you right. do? If right. something, if somebody happened to invade or uh, attack, would we be up to it? Would we survive? Right. What if your city was destroyed? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that could potentially go wrong in a world right. like the one we live in. And if we're not taking things seriously, which in my opinion, I look around, we're not taking things seriously. It's largely due to the fact that we're fat and happy as, a, as, a, as you know, and we don't want to lose the comforts and the luxuries and the whatever this like, basically we're lay out of science. Right. And the catalyst would basically be the proverbial fire under the, the rear end, so to speak, of, yes. you know, things going bad. And now you've got to do something, right? right. That's what so, that's what I was wondering. So at least we're on a, in agreement on that. So if, I just if curious. things go helter skelter, so to speak, if things go yeah. to hell in a handbasket, and yeah. people are serious about, oh my God, this is this is this is scary. This is this is worrisome, right? Right. right. 
And again, I'm not a doomer. I'm not trying to spread fear. That's not well, it. Well, it's it's, it's, it's sort of re it's realism. It's a, I mean, we're living a, it right now. So. It's about being serious and sober minded. Right. It's about it it's about not being casual about things that are important. It's not about oh, it's it's about not overlooking the things that you should be looking at. Uh, right. it, it's about not ignoring things that you know. I'm saying you you wouldn't you know. I'm saying you wouldn't you wouldn't go off and leave your your stove. You know what I'm saying? You have to be mindful right. of things. You know right. what I'm saying? You have to be sober about things. You can't be reckless and careless and, and you know, just all fat and happy and everything's all, you know. Well, my pr my pr I went to a Christian thing. school. I went to a Christian school in my my senior year. My principal said something that always stuck with me. It's like a Christian, a, a wise Christian always has one, one like – hand holding the bible open and one hand holding the newspaper open so you're looking at how the bible is reflective of what's happening in your current time so you can be ready for what's happening around you because you need to prepare the people like you, you know regard we are teachers and students but also we need to help the people that aren't the, paying attention the critical thing is the open door mm -hmm. we talked about that the the in the book of revelation when he's talking to the churches the, the next to the last church had the uh, place before them an open door because they had just a little bit of strength, right? And um, it has to do with the opening and the shutting of the word. It has to be, because the door is the word, because the door is Jesus and Jesus is the logos. You know, it goes right. around and around and around on itself. Right. You know what I'm saying? And again, that's what the ultimate simplicity here is that everything goes around and around and around on itself. I keep, you know, part of my hesitancy is I keep, I keep saying the same things over and over and over again, and still, and again, this is not, again, again, in the way of a complaint, um, but again, it just, it's, it's a function of, I've been, you know, putting things out for a very long time, and people have known the truth for a very long time, and yet there are a lot of other things that are still playing out, and I don't have, you know, 20 million, 30 million people looking at my stuff. You know, it's 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 a right. large number, and they, and they should not, they should be, <laughs> but it's yeah. not critical yeah. mass because right. there's plenty of other things. And I'm wondering if you know perhaps we're not manifesting things like we should be. I, again, I, I don't know. I, you have to take things in God's timing, like like it says in Judith. You know, who are we to try to to make demands on on Him? You know, what I'm right. saying He's going to use yes. who He's going to use, and He's going to do it how He wants to do it. And that we need to respect that, you know. And his timing, as, is, his timing is very, very far from what humans think. You know what I'm saying? Like it's ne if you look at the Bible, it's never like you would never think the th scenarios that happen would play out the way that they do in the Bible. In every chapter, it's like, how did he do it? You know, it's insane. It's insane. It, but, but it's happening. It happened then, and it's happening now. So you have to have faith and believe it's going to happen in, in his timing. You're right. Okay. So, but getting back to Genesis, though. Um, again, <laughs> the idea is that, that he's calling the light the day. And again, we don't walk at night. We walk by the day. We're not children of night. You see what I'm saying? The idea is that he's talking about a spiritual day here, right? right. Um, and he called the darkness night, the kingdom of the day, the kingdom of the night, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, the children of light, the children. You know what I'm saying? It just goes on and on and on in its own logic you know the wealth of the earth versus the wealth of heaven you know what i'm saying the the you know what i'm saying it's just how how things that uh, they have this this twofold um aspect and so when he talks about evening and he talks about morning right even in the the same the same terminology that we use in thomas where he talks about look do not worry it from morning until evening and from evening until morning about what you will wear, right? Um, what does he mean? Well, when he says from morning until evening, he's talking from the early church age, which was the morning, the dawn, you know, when the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart, right? The idea is that they had that knowledge and that revelation. So don't worry from morning until evening. Evening symbolizes the loss of that knowledge, the loss of the light, the, the coming of the night the coming of the darkness, the coming of that age of the interim, that 2,000 years, right? Remember, it was 2,000 pigs that that went into the, the, the Sea of Galilee, right? So that, that represents this, this lost age of 2,000 years, 
you know, I call it the I call it the age of the false Christians, which is what the well, what the yeah, because the pigs are the Christians yeah. and the dogs are the the the, the Jews. Yeah. Well, again, so as not to offend, we're talking about the the right. false Christians and the false Jews. So let's just put it right. that way. And right. you always see that too. Do not cast your pearls before swine, and do not give what is holy to dog. Um, right. Thomas makes and it clear you, that the, Thomas makes it clear that the dogs are the Jews when are the Sadducees or the 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 the, the the Jews when he says that the the Pharisees are like a dog returns on a cat on the cattle trough but he neither eats nor he let nor does he let the cattle eat right and um uh when when um you see again you see dogs and 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 pigs together constantly um again in uh uh, uh second Peter when he says you know of them the proverbs are true that the dog returns to its own vomit right that that's essentially the false jews going back to their old teaching in other words the thing that came out of their mouth right, right which comes from so what used to come which, what, yeah. what came out of their mouth was their teaching right? right so the vomit is their teaching so if you if you follow their religion you're eating vomit and, because that uh, comes the vomit the vomit comes out of their mouth but when jesus healed the man's sight he spit directly in his eyes so he could see so that's the same thing yeah, that's, that's what comes right up that's come yeah. out of your mouth that's the right, direct right. that's the direct right. understanding and just, and then, just real quick um you're i just want to direct people if they're watching this right now i'm directing you to robert's um spiritual keys pdf it's at scriptural hyphen truth.com all my viewers know about this i've led them there many times but there's a full list of the keys on there that tells you everything we're talking about it, so you can look at it yourself go ahead well yeah well, just to complete the thought though um when when he says that and, and uh, again that is a reference to proverbs i think it is chapter 26 without the dog returning to its own vomit and then he goes and then he says besides this and the and the swine or the sow that was once washed goes back to her wallowing in the mire or the mud mm -hmm. right and what was mud again you mentioned you mentioned the guy spitting in well you mentioned jesus spitting into the guy's eyes right that was that was one of the that was one of the healings of two of two of two parts it's a two-step props two, process one of two part, yeah. you keep getting pulled off on, on side tangents here but yeah, okay but but the idea was that that was the water was the word the spit that came straight out of his mouth so that's like the person who basically reads the scriptures or whatever and he asked the guy well how do you see well okay that this is the second the second one the other part was where he healed uh he healed the guy um in two parts he he spit into the ground right Earthly understanding um and yeah well okay i'm getting these two completed the first one <laughs> right. he put in the guy's eyes and he said what do you see and he says well i see men but they look like trees walking right right trees have to do with teachings like the tree of knowledge of good and evil right or the, right. the, the they just have to do with doctrines or the, the trees, trees without or the trees without fruit or the the axes laid at the root of the tree yeah or, like, like John, mean, they, they, yeah. yeah exactly the teachings the axes laid yeah. at the roots of the teachings this is what because this is how you know that john the baptist knew the language because he used it i am the voice of one crying in the wilderness i am the secret language here in other words crying yep. out and nobody hears it you know what I'm right. saying? And that, that's, how, that's how Herod learned it because he listened to John the Baptist. So he gave an inspired speech because he learned it from John because and he was a fox. So he because he, so that's another pair another key is he was a fox, which is, you know, going back to animals being referenced as people, which is what it does in Barnabas. But go ahead. Sorry. Well, anyways, but getting back to. OK, so then he says, you see him like trees walking and then he puts his hands on him. Right. And hands are symbolic of works. Right, you work right. with your hands, right? Yep. And then the guy said, then the guy saw clearly, right? So in other words, it's a mixture of his word, word, plus him, his doings, right? And that guy represents all of us. He's telling us that our sight is going to be a two-step process. One is going to have to do um, with just seeing his word alone, right? And then the other one comes after he's done his works and we're touched by those works, right? In other words, we see the works of his hands, right? And so at that point, he sees perfectly, but he's telling us that this is gonna be broken up into two steps. You know, one uh, where, where he sees imperfectly, let's say, because he's, he's, he's trying to see things um, 
he's not he's not seeing his works yet. He hasn't seen the age yet. You are only going to know things in their perfection when you are at the end of time looking at things in retrospect and decoding things in retrospect. Only then will you know the works he has done over the age because you will be interpreting them. Like it says right. in Barnabas, that you, you're going right. to be interpreting these parables and you'll see them in retrospect. But what I'm trying right. to do is I'm trying to trying to relate here. So there was a second set. There was a second time where he healed in two parts. Right. And this one is even more explicit. Right. Because he spits literally into the ground. Right. So, again, that same spit is the word coming out of his mouth. And then he, he spits into the ground and he puts the mud in his eyes. Right. So what is that? Well, the mud is the earth. So again, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? The heavenly and the earthly. So in other words, his word mixed with the earth is an earthly understanding of his word. So the guy can't see at all. See, because when it was just the word, he could see things pretty clear. Not perfectly, but he could still see on some level, right? right. That was the difference. If you put those two side by side. The other guy could not see at all. They put the, he literally put the mud over his eyes. It was just as good as him having no vision. And then right. he said, and then he said, he said, now I want you to go to the pool of Siloam, right? And John makes sure he, he puts it, he interjects there so that you know that he says that means scent, S-E-N-T. So this pool of water and water is the word, right? That will, that has been sent. So when that word comes back to us, right? What do we wash out of our eyes? Because that guy represents us. We're getting that healing, right? We're washing that theology out of our eyes, that earthly false uh, teaching, right? And it, so it's a teaching. He's saying, look, if you mix my word with the earth, right, you're not going to see until this word gets sent to you, until this collection of my word gets sent to you, the pool of Siloam, which means sent, right? So that's, that's those two things you put together, right? If you see just by God's word, you see somewhat, right? And then when you understand the works of his hands, then you're, they're seeing is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So the one sees his works and the other one uses that scripture that is sent, not the one, you know, see what I'm saying? Not the one that was already caked into his eyes, right? right? But what is going to be sent, which is the, the third revelation, the third testament, if you will, a pool, a collection. Anytime you see a cup, do I have to drink of this cup? Do I have to drink of this canon, in other words, this, this mm -hmm. container of my word, right? Mm -hmm. Do I have to drink from, you know, anytime you see a cup or a bushel or something that just contains something, that's symbolic of the canon. That's symbolic of putting walls, fences around his word, fencing it in and saying it's just this. So well, like I'm the saying, six jars, the six jars at the wedding that was water and then it turned into wine like that. Type after, of thing, right? yeah, after, after they were all filled. Right. And then he they were all filled. pull it out by the time you saying So it's the fulfillment mm -hmm. of the 6,000 years. Right. And then we get the true wine. Right. The, which, in, which, which, if you want, if you want to think about that too, I don't want to go off topic real quick, but um, in your keys thing, it says Abraham represents the Jews. Isaac represents the Christians and Jacob represents the elect. And if you think about it, Abraham had a third wife, which represents the Holy Spirit's testament, which is the third testament, which right. she had six sons. And remember you said Paul never Spirit, speaks about yeah. her. He never speaks about her because she had six sons. That's, the, again, the 6,000 years, which is the six jars that were at the wedding. Same thing. It's, it's, it's repeated constantly in the Bible, like all the time. Everything's always repeated. Sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, but so, okay, so, but, but the idea is that the water with the, the, the earthly teaching is the mud so when in second peter when he says in the sow that was once washed remember just in the water right goes back to her wallowing in the mud right which is the mixture it's the, which mixture, is the of, mixture of the earthly teaching with god's word right which is incorrect so what, he, what he's saying is that the that the, the the pigs the swine represent the christians because again the year is the the age is two thousand years the christian age is two thousand years and again the number of pigs mark tells us they go that the demons go into mm -hmm. and then down the hill into the water, right? Is 2000. Right. Right. So that 2000 year period is associated with the pigs. Which and the demon the said, are you come here to torment us before the time? So with the time cue right before they get cast into right. the pigs. So, right. like you said, so again, it's all consistent. It all goes around and around and around so that when you go back and you plug into, um, into the sow that was washed, goes back to her wallowing in the mire. Right. 
Um, and then the pig puts the pearls into, uh, tramples them into the, to the mud, right? You get the idea is that the, the, the pearl, which is the, um, which is like the treasure, which is like right. the, 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 the spiritual meaning or whatever, um, mm -hmm. that it gets, I just, I just did this on my last show. Sullied, I just talked about it. Yep. Right. It gets sullied by the earthly teaching is what that and he means. got rid of and he, and he got rid of all of the other pearls that he could have chosen and picks the one large pearl which represents all like as a one big teaching it's not the just a bunch of little right right the unitary thought the gospel of truth makes this play he talks about look it's all a big unitary thought right and so when you go and you plug everything back into genesis like i was saying here you know the the day means like the the understanding right? The night, the darkness, it all means the same thing. Um, so, but the idea is that the evening and the morning, right? He called, and the evening and the morning were the first day, or in other words, the first, um, the first thing you got to know, or the first revelation, so to speak, or the, or the idea is that there is the heavenly light and there is the, the darkness, the infernal darkness. So, you, so the first teaching is the idea of the light and the darkness, Mm -hmm. It's probably the best way to put it. The first day, the first light, the first insight, the first, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like That's that. the way I see it. I see it that way. I know what you're talking about. So, I didn't, I didn't actually, I, I never thought about this. I never thought about this. I've, I've, I've listened to every teaching you've done. Never thought about this until you mentioned a, a couple of shows ago that you were doing a study on this. To, and it's very difficult to explain, kind of like Revelation is very hard to explain. This is just as hard, in a sense, to explain, even using the keys. But it, when you look at it, it makes perfect sense. And I never saw it until you told me about it. I, I don't well, know why I, mean, I never saw it that way. Why, that's that's kind of why I brought it up because I, you know, I, I realized that that wasn't something I had ever really tried it out before. And so, you know, um, again, the way that it progresses. Okay. So we've already passed the first day, the first insight, the first revelation, the first thing you need to know, whatever you want to call that day. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, mm -hmm. um, because a day is when you can see things and a day is when you can, you know, do things. And you know what I'm saying? It's just, it has right. to do with those kinds of things. Okay. So, and God said, let there be a firmament or division in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, before I go too far into this, the waters are the scriptures, right? That you be washed by the, by the washing of the water of the word, right? The idea, and, and, and the shepherd of Hermas makes this very clear with the tower being built upon the water because the church is built upon the word of God, right? So, you know what I'm saying? Um, yes. This, the, that's explained. Um, and so the idea is that the waters are the waters of the waters. And yeah, Revelation also, also talks about the many waters as being the different peoples of the earth. But you have to understand these people have different canons. They have different, you know what I'm saying? And so yes. it's just by extension. Um, and so why did he make a, a firmament in the division of the waters? In other words, there, there are waters like Moses does this and, and, um, and um, Joshua the, does this too. The, yep. the, 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 this, the parting of the waters, right? Yep. So that you can make it across on dry land. That's the secular, right? That, that God has divided the waters and given you a certain amount of time. And then the waters come crashing in and kill your enemies, in other words, the idea is that the reunification of the scriptures, the ones to the left, the ones to the right, or in this particular instance, the ones above versus the ones below, those that are kept in heaven and those that we possess on earth. Right? Oh, wow. That even goes back to Noah, too. The waters. Well, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So, I'm getting ahead no, of myself. Sorry. <laughs> so, but, but again, that's why he says, let there be a firmament or a division in the midst of the waters. And... um. And uh, like I talk about in the Revelation series, the midst has to do with centrality. It has to do with what's truly in, at, at the heart of things. You know, again, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the midst of the garden. It was central. It was right. something, that, something that is absolutely central um, has to do um, with that which is essential, that which is foundational, that which is right in the middle of everything. The whole, you know, this... It, we, we talk about this. We talk about something, the, the meaning is, is central or it's, you know, it's right. like the heart of this. Or, you know what I'm saying? We use the same yeah. kind of about way of speaking. This should be no right. surprise. Um, and in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters, right? So there's, there's divisions, 
right between one congregation and another and between the 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 scriptures that we accept and the scriptures that we reject so to speak right. very generalized phenomenon here but it it has to do with the, the treatment if you will and god caused this division it was on purpose he wanted books to be held back he wanted scriptures water whatever to be separated from other scriptures water you know whatever he wanted right. those things to be held back until the time of the end just like the pool is sent right right that was held back you see that what i'm saying sense. but it's able yep. to you're able he symbolizes the two parts of the church age the 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 initial problem was theology his word that came out of his mouth mixed with the earth or the earthly teaching right again there's the heavenly and there's the earthly right and then you know the, the fact that this guy basically walks across time symbolically until he gets that 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 revelation that is sent that collection of water that's sent in other words whatever's left that we haven't discovered yet or that we haven't explained you know what i'm saying but that is left to us to discover that is sent to us at the end of time you know what i'm saying um right that that's what that symbolizes and when he's able to wash out all of that uh all of that um um what you call all that that mud and stuff see and then what does he do he goes and gets into it with the scribes and the pharisees and he totally gives them the business <laughs> Right? He's all yeah. over those guys, right? You know, yeah, it's amazing. You, what, what fools you are is basically what he's saying. You see me, you see this guy, right? And that's how it's going to be. We see. Right. And we're able to just, we could toy with these people if we wanted to. If we, you know what I'm saying? Not saying yeah. that should be our approach, but that was that guy's approach. He, right. he was, he was pretty, he was pretty, pretty harsh with them. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, but he got, Jesus already. Jesus uses that again later and just, um, you know, he, he talks about how they go and they bathe in the pool of David or whatever, and they wash the outside of the cup, but they don't wash the inside of the cup or something like that, mm -hmm. which again is speaking of the water. So it's like, it's like their, their, their outside is clean, but the inside, the spiritual part of them is dirty because they're not accepting Jesus, which is the word, which is this, this, you know, the, the Jesus Christ, the higher level meaning of everything. They don't even accept Jesus as, you know, the lower level meaning of it, but whatever. Go ahead. Well, but, the, but that's the thing though. It's if for them, it's like a ticking time bomb that they don't know is going to go off. It's right. going to completely blow up the foundation that, because look, every church everywhere, I don't like to speak of any church in particular because none of them are going to escape the judgment. Now, right. again, that isn't because of any malice or whatever, but because you got to get rid of the old to, to, to do the new, you know what I'm saying? At some point you're going to have to, to rip that bandaid off. You know what I'm saying? And let, well, it and talks let, about that. It talks about that in the Apocrypha of John. Is that a, the Apocryphon of John where he says, and, and uh, John's talking to Jesus or God, and he's saying, um, and then what will you do? And he's telling them how each group will be judged, the Jews, the Christians, then the elect or whatever. I don't know if you've read the, the book, but, uh, you know, that, that in a sense is what we're talking about right now. He, he goes through all the people that will be judged according to what basically their sins, according to what they did in their life, but also what they accepted as God's word. I guess that's what it talks about. I don't know if you ever read it, but. Well, I think it's the but, that, but that holds it. But I mean, that just underscores when you when you're talking about, like, for example, the book of Hebrews, quoting the second book of Maccabees or quoting right. the martyrdom of Isaiah, for example. So yep. right there in, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, right there in the chapter of faith. Right. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that you're not going to you're going to believe everything up to that point. And when he makes reference to second Maccabees, you're going to be like, well, let me just throw that behind my back. Right. right. Oh, and when he makes reference to uh, the martyrdom of Isaiah, right, you're just going to like throw that behind your back. So where's your faith? It's all a test, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, when I when I try to explain things, I I, I, I equate God with truth in a lot of re respects because there, I don't see any difference between God and truth. You know, if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't accept God, um, I sometimes just like to substitute the truth itself. The truth right. itself is telling you something, right? right. The, the truth itself is showing you something, right? So you, you don't come to me with you don't believe in God. What about the truth itself? You know in your heart when you're going against the truth. You know in your heart when you're kicking against the pricks. You know in your heart. You know what I'm saying? So let me, let me start yes. with something you do know. Let me start with something you do believe. This actually happened. This is why when you see these people make mistakes over and over and over again, they're just stepping on rakes all the time. You know what I'm saying? Just just messing up and, and never learning, never learning, never. It's because they don't have any respect for the truth. They want their way and that's it. 
You know what I'm saying? They don't care about anything that's outside of themselves. They're, they're letting their, their belly be their God. They're letting their, their eyes and their ears and their desires or whatever be their God. They're, they're being led around that and they're putting that above truth. That's why they don't learn. That's why, because they don't want to, they don't, they don't want to seek anything outside of themselves. Right. Right. So and it's, it says in, it says in Ecclesiasticus, which is apocryphal, that we're supposed to fight to the death for truth. Actually, I read that the other night on my channel. Yeah. I think it's chapter chapter four of Ecclesiasticus, which is a whole wisdom text made by Jesus, son of Sirach. And we don't even we don't even read it. Well, it, just, it's ask got yourself, so just ask yourself why that's held back for our time. Right. Because we need it. <laughs> uh, my well, opinion, that's, we that's going to be the directive. You know, you got to You got to make a decision. But the right. idea, okay, but could, just getting back to like the firmament, though, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So, in other words, there were there were things that were, again, in in this particular case, we're talking about figurative waters. We're talking about the scriptures which are held back in heaven, right? Enoch talks about this all the time. The heavenly tablets. He talks in in one hundred four and one hundred five that scriptures will be given to us, and that it's our job. To reveal it to them with our wisdom mm -hmm. right and, and this is what's always bothered me i mean again i i understand that there's a lot of side roads that you can travel there are a lot of tangents you can go on mm -hmm. you can go seeking after archaeology you could go seeking after cosmology you could go seeking after linguistics you could go seeking after a lot of things but it, when it really boils down to it this is the most central this is the most essential thing. God's word itself is the most central thing. Right? I know what you're talking about. I, so, I said this. So there are a lot of things that I feel like are competing with this. They may be reading the book of Enoch, but they're reading it for some other purpose. They may be, they may be, uh, they may be espousing something that may or may not be true. I, you know, I'm not going to get into that argument. I'm going to try to keep my eye on the ball here. The right. logos is what's central. This is, the, and the reason why, and I'll explain. The reason why is because, look, your knowledge of the word is the thing you're going to be held accountable for, right? The fact that, that, that Jude, for example, agrees with Enoch, says that it's ancient, the seventh from Adam, says that it, it's prophetic, he prophesied, right? Mm -hmm. uh, says that, uh, that, uh, that the prophecy is of these particular people that are in his church at that time, right? right? Unironically affirms this scripture and then gives you a long verse, right? Just so that you know that the book he's talking about is that same book you got in your hand, right? right. It's an identifier. This is a, this is a deliberate act on his part. And this is a, this is a feature of the Holy spirit. The Holy spirit is going to say, look, Jude thinks this is right. Why don't you? Mm -hmm. Jude thinks this is ancient. Why don't you? Jude's reading this book as authoritative. Why aren't you, right? Or Hebrews, right? Uh, uh, whoever wrote it, Hebrews is also reading Second Maccabees. Whoever wrote Hebrews is also reading the Ascension of Isaiah. Um, you know, why are can, I, can I just can I pause for one yeah. second? Mm -hmm. Can I pause for one second? Um, so this is uh, important. Uh, this is common. Robert, I don't know if you know this, but I, I'm sure you do. But this, this is a common teaching out there right now. The Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. Okay, for, first 10 patriarchs or whatever. Mm -hmm. A man, um, th this is their meanings. Adam, a man, a so it keeps going down, Seth, and I'm just not going to read all the names. A man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. So the first 10 patriarchs, their names mean Jesus, who will come in the future. OK, now Jude says Enoch seventh from Adam. Enoch's name in that statement, which means Jesus is teaching. That's mm -hmm. what it means. So isn't it kind of odd that the people now in modern day times, when they read Jude, who is the half brother of Jesus and sat at his table and ate dinner with him and they don't accept what he's telling you about Enoch who is the righteous scribe, who his name means teaching from a prediction of the future when Jesus will come and bring comfort to his people. And, all, and that's what people do. Even Christians to this day are saying Enoch is evil because they don't realize that Cain had a son whose name was Enoch, but it was 
Jesus, it says, if you read all the other books, it says that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was born to counteract the magic that Cain's son, Enoch, was doing and leading the people astray. So I'm just saying, his name means teaching. We are teaching things that are in the, that Enoch prophesied about that would happen. The elect would teach the people the truth. You see what I'm saying? It's just, I can't even believe that that's even possible, well, that all these things are going around on itself. Again, this just, this orchestrates, see... Okay, <laughs> I just touched on so many things. Um, it, it's Sorry, it's very clear about this in the Gospel of Philip that God uses the evil people of this world. All right, right. he he, you know, just like you would use any kind of farm animal, any kind of you know, right, right, right. Like, <laughs> they're 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 at your service. You know what I'm saying? He's smarter than they are. All right, he he has more clout than they do. Right. He has a lot more say in what goes on in his reality than than they do. He because he knows what they're going to do, the way they the way they are. He, in the Book of Wisdom talks about this, too, that they were just that way by nature. There was nothing you could do about them. They just are are crooked in their, their natures. The world, they, these people are still out there. Right. The wicked and the ungodly are a spiritual species of, of people that exist and there are things you'll never understand about them, thank God, because you'd have to be a, a certain level of depravity to even know where they're coming from, right? right. But you can kind of know of them. And, and the idea is that these people exist. And not to get too graphic, but there's some, there's a, people are capable of pretty bad things. You know, when, when people talk about, oh, the Nazis were capable of doing this and the, whatever they were capable of doing that, um, no, they were they they were alive at that time, but people are capable of doing those things. Right, like, they're inherently they, evil. It yeah. wasn't that they were capable of them; they are capable of them. So, so when you look at, at people in this world, you have to understand that that you know uh, that people hide behind um, virtue. People hide behind. Uh, an illusion of good they always try to hide evil within good if i was if i was a really evil 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 person what would stop me from putting on the pretense that i was a really really good person you know what i'm saying Nothing. and and you know what i'm saying that's why everybody has to be tried and um you know to be honest with you just because i prophesy doesn't mean i'm a good person look at saul is saul among the prophets right comes down to it, God's going to do what he's going to do with whoever he wants to do it with. Right. You know what I'm saying? It really boils yeah. down to it. You know, know, why would he choose, why would he choose Jonah? Didn't he know Jonah was, you know, he, he really didn't Gonna want to run him. away. He didn't want <laughs> right. them to get off the hook. He had, right. he had a, he had a pretty big bone of contention with these people and he was ready to see them fry. You know right. what I'm saying? And um, why would God choose him? You know what I'm saying? The truth is he can use anybody. I'm not saying Jonah was a bad dude. He was flawed, you know, right. but everybody was flawed. Peter was flawed. David was flawed. Solomon was flawed. Everybody was flawed, right? right. Anybody can be flawed. And that's for, that's for the sake of humility. God's not going to have anybody boasting in front of him. You know, right. he's not going to have anybody saying, well, you know, I, you know it's not going to happen to anybody. Everybody's going to bow the knee. Everybody's going to eat some crow. Just going to happen. It is right. what it is. But when it boils down to it, it's like you said, fight to the death. You got to have you got to have a little bit of skin in the game. You know what I'm saying? And that's why these evil people have hegemony, because see, look, good. You what what good is heroism if it's untried? You know, right. what good is virtue if it's unexpressed? What, what good is any of that? You know, uh, James says the same thing. Oh, well, be be filled or whatever. You know what I'm saying? What? Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. You know what I'm right. saying? Do something. It's your, it's your actions right? it's mixed you with do. what you say. Yeah. Well, and yeah. it's not just what you do because you can feign. You know, it, it's about <laughs> what you're willing to risk. And it's about what you're willing to give up. 
I think that's where the the the, the real you know the, the it's your it's your faith is. it's your faith and your works like basically because like remember Paul says that like I'll sh I'll show you my my works or something like that and you show me your faith or whatever whatever but he's saying like basically like like you have to do both you can't just be just one or the other you have to show it and live it like and do it and think it and it's like it's who you are it's like the whole thing not just one or the other like you said like you we can, have you can we have know it but not do it. Well, we have an opportunity to escape it. Um, I give you a couple of examples. We go start back with Jonah. All right? all right. What happened in Nineveh? It got saved because they repented. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't get uh, the fire come down from heaven on them. All right. And Jonah was away myth about sins. that. He was like, you, "You're kidding me! You're telling <laughs> more, me he's more mad about the tree that the You know right. what I'm saying? He's yeah. bitter. Right? Yeah. But then God's like, you know what? They don't know anything. They don't have nothing, right? Yeah. These people, you don't, can't you have a little mercy on these people for crying out loud? You know what I'm saying? Right. And so he gave Jonah the business. So who really right. needed it? We came down to it. You know what I'm saying? Or the same yeah. thing in the same thing in the Shepherd of Hermas when when the he showed the vision of of Hagrin or Segri or whatever. It, just per, it showed different ways, but it was the the fiery beast that came along, right? Yeah. And it passed him by without any event whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, he's, and he was told, literally, look, you know, if, 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 if it be his will and if it should be his way, you know what I'm saying? This will pass, you by, pass by you uneventfully. Right. Like, that, that sounds a little strange because that's the judgment to come. In other words, this could, this could turn out really, really, really well. You know what I'm right. saying? Which is I, a little I, I paradoxical. But see, that's the thing. There is his mercy and there is his judgment. There, he, I see what you're saying. He, has, he holds the whole thing in, in his own balance. And it's according to his own desire. Um, I think that if it really boils down to it, if we, need, if we need to have our riches removed from us, that's going to happen. Because right. that's the only way he's going to get to us. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And so just a word to the wise, you know, it would be better to plead for his mercy uh, than to be stubborn and suffer his wrath. You right. know what I'm saying? I think that yeah. much lies within our hands. I think God knew that Nineveh was going to uh, repent. Yep. I think he knew that Jonah was going to give him the business about it. You know what I'm saying? And he just yeah. he just put it all together and let it all play out. You know, and, and that was the point. The point was, look, sometimes these people, they're not, it, you, you don't know, you don't know what my plans are. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it isn't yes. for you to decide how I, how this plays out. Right. You know what I'm saying? Who are you to tell me what should happen? You know right. what I'm saying? That, I think that happened in the Testament of Abraham or something when he's flying around with the angel and he's seeing all these people all around the world doing all these different sins. <laughs> he was Jesus. killing everybody. <laughs> yeah, he's killing everybody. <laughs> and he's like, getting, he's killing every single person he could find. And, and he's like, no, call him back. Call so, Abraham so, back. But, he's but, not, this he's knowledge, <laughs> but this knowledge, this open door is his mercy, is what yeah. I'm saying. This open door is an open invitation for us to take him in and sup with you know to come in and sup with him you know and him with us right oh my gosh i'm open you know, to i'm open to ecclesiasticus piece. i'm open to ecclesiasticus right now it says this right on when i look down to him belong both mercy and wrath and sinners feel the weight of his retribution come back to the lord without delay do not put it off from one day to the next or suddenly the lord's wrath will be upon you and you will perish in the time of reckoning so it says repent, just like we yeah, were just talking kinda, about. It's kind of up to us how this plays out, I think. Um, you yeah. know, he's going to do what he has to do. Um, I, I would urge people to be sober-minded, to be level-headed. See, people are going to see this as some sort of off-the-wall, bizarre kind of teaching. All right? Mm -hmm. The fact is I'm so Ben Stein about this that I don't think people get excited when I talk. You know what I'm saying? Because it's just yeah. so dry and it's so matter-of-fact. But see, that's the thing. I always was a rational person back in the days when I was an atheist and back at the time when I was abusing Christians. You see what I'm saying? I think that 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 God wanted me to eat a little humble pie and to have a little bit of that, you know, uh, a taste of my own medicine kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Because it was good for me and it was right for me and it was just and I deserved it. You know what I'm saying? What I didn't deserve was being shown the mercy that he showed me. Right. You see what I'm saying? 
And yes. so who, who would I be to deny somebody the same mercy that I was shown, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and that I think everybody listening, probably whoever came to Jesus or whatever had that moment where they, they recognized the, that, that they had to be, um, the, the, they had to change. They had to metamorphosize, you know what I'm saying? And, and yes. this is what this, this is what this is supposed to do. Like it says in the book of Enoch, we're supposed to reveal it to the world, to show them with our wisdom. The waters that are above the firmament, this is, this is the heavenly scriptures that are held in heaven for us, that are, that are written on the heavenly tablets or whatever. But that's these words, the, this, this, the words that are sent to us, in other words, over time. Um, we're probably not going to have time to get to where I wanted to get with all of this. Um, but that was the direction that I'm heading. As you just go down the list... What is, what is the evening and what is the morning? The evening is the loss of things. The morning is the dawn. You know, Peter talks about this. When the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Jesus talks about this too. When you overcome, I will give you the morning star. That's a future thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we know what the morning star is. We know that it's in our heart. It, it's, it's becoming, um, it's, it's, at some point, we will transform into our angelic natures. Um, when in the Gospel of Philip, right, he talked about that they were on the holy mountain, and they saw Elijah and Moses in their in their exalted state, which is clearly what it, this is it, it clearly in agreement with the the canonical stuff. And then um, he says, but what really happened? was that the apostles, Peter, James, and John, their spirits were raised so that they could see them, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of like, that's, that's, that's the real insight, is to realize and to recognize that, like it says in Philip, when you see the things of heaven, you become them, right? right. At some point, again, it happened to Stephen. Stephen was transitioning from the man to the angel, right? Mm -hmm. He was transitioning. It was something that happened to him in the spirit where he was seeing into heaven. He saw the father and the son, you know, in the heaven, right? Mm -hmm. He could see them and they could see him, right? And Paul, he had to see, Paul underwent uh, like, okay, you know how Jesus and Christ, uh, Jesus represents the lower level. Of, it was the name he was given at his yes. circumcision, which is the cutting off of the flesh, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the name that he was known by, but his title his, his, his designation, if you will, was the Christ, the Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. And that was Peter's insight. Thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God, right? Not the dead God, the living God. The living scriptures, you're living, they come alive when you see them and you hear them and you understand them in your heart, right? And you're able to communicate them with your mouth, right? I mean, I, it, it's, it's just, it just flows when you give over the idea that there's all these divisions and there's this and there's that, and it's all particularized and contextualized. No, it's one spirit. You have to think like a child. It, you have to give up your pride. You have to swallow that a little bit. You have to look at what God would do and, and why this makes sense. This makes sense because again, the higher level meaning and the lower level meaning exists in an identical space and time. They occupy the same space and time. So when the lower level meaning is transmitted in its lower state, it is for the purposes of conveyance. It is for the purposes of preservation. And when he deems it time, the spirit of God is going to pour out upon the people, just like it did in the time of the Acts of the Apostles, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know of people who are running around healing people. I don't know of people who are running around raising the dead, but we're going to be doing that. At right. some point, that's going to happen again, and it's going to be at his discretion, and it's going to be whoever he chooses, not whoever we choose. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to be the guy doing it that's doing it. You know right. what I'm saying? And and it's just it's just that simple. You know, these people had an agenda. This is how you know the good from the bad. People who want a subjective reality, they want things the way they want them, right? And they their God is their self. Right. Their their pride is first and foremost. You know, they're seated in their own heart. They're seated in their own mind. Okay. They lean on their own understanding they, instead of God's. Yeah, yeah, that is who they are, and that's where they're coming from. Now, I'm not saying all those people were condemned. You know, right. how many of us were atheists? How many of us were other religions? How many of us were indifferent? You know what I'm saying? How many, where did we all come from? Did we not have to 
from the streets. Ourselves. You know, the people that some, were, if we're, we're invited to the wedding following the this end. message, anybody following this message, I doubt very seriously there's anybody on this podcast right now uh, who doesn't give a, 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 a whatever about the truth. Something right. is, something inside of them is leading them, right? And again, this could be confirmation bias, but just listen to what I'm saying. Is does it ring true? The, 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 what I'm saying, what I'm saying is is enormous. What I'm saying is, is enormous. I'm saying that look, and again, this isn't me. This is us. Okay. Right. I might be a voice crying out in the wilderness, but so are you. So is anybody who receives the revelation, who gets the eyes to see, who gets the ears to hear, who gets the mind of Christ, the mind to think, right? And who's able to do then the works of God, who's able to put these things together and make sense of things, or who's able to express them, you know, from their mouth because they've been purified in their hearts and their minds and they're seeing and they're hearing and, they're, and then it all flows. It's like, yes, 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 yes. He's not yes and no, he's yes. That's what Paul right. says. So well, one big thing. Well, Paul, Paul taught Barnabas, or Barnabas learned with Paul, and it says Barnabas 11, 2, For the prophet saith, Be astonished, O heaven, and let the earth shudder the more at this. For this people hath done two evil things. They abandoned me, the fountain of life. So there's the water, and there's the heaven, and there's the earth. And they digged for themselves a pit of death. So the death is in the earth, which is the pit that they dug for themselves in the earthly understanding. It's right. And that go back to Genesis. You got it right there. And Barnabas learned this from Paul. And so it all goes around on itself. You can learn all these keys by learning from Barnabas, who learned it from Paul. And then if you go back to all Paul's teachings, you can learn what he's talking about when he speaks of Jesus and Christ and Christ Jesus. You just learn what it, it, the heavenly, earthly, heavenly, earthly, and earthly, heavenly. It just goes back and forth. It's, it's very simple when you just, like you said, learn as if you're a child. You're relearning these things. Don't go back to the old ways when you go into this stuff. Think of it in a new, fresh way. Put uh, new, new wine into new wineskins, or else it will right. burst. Sorry, go ahead. Well, anyway, so, but the idea, okay, so the idea is uh, he's put this division there because, again, when, when, when the Red Sea was parted, it was temporary. The words that were to the right and the words that were to the left, let's say, the, the water that was to the right and the water that was to the left came back together again, right? Um, when Joshua crossed the Jordan, right? There was the, there was the, 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 the heaping up, if you will, of the water. These things are kind of held back while we travel across, you know what I'm saying, the dry land or the secular, the, the age of, of secularism. We're not, right. not founded upon the water, but founded right. upon the dry land. That is you said say. that you said that in the um, Revelation series that the dry land represents the dry places or the places without water, which is without God's word. So these are the like the places that don't have God's word, or what? I think that's what you said. Well, yeah, it gets it, that's uh, yeah, that's also here in Genesis one. I mean, it separates you know the waters from the dry land. You know what I'm saying? These are these are yeah. the world systems and the way in which they operate. Which I don't think we're going to get a chance to get through wholly in this particular discussion but that's where right. this is headed the idea is that is that the creation story see here this is this is a big bone of contention and this is something that part of the reason the part like i did an outline for this back in 2015 i think it was the first time i really tried to flesh this out and my immediate thought was you know this this angle or whatever is going to rankle a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? People, <laughs> yes. want to, people make a lot of things out of this. And I'm not going to go into all the things that people make out of this. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, but you, you run the risk of alienating people. But sometimes that's just what you have to do. You have to, you have to say, look, you can't make this into concrete stuff here. This is spiritual language. This is a revelation. It looks like it's a creation story and that's it. Right. But it's conveying something higher than itself. It's, 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 it's conveying something revelatory as opposed to merely, um, you know, it's to me, I think it means a lot more than what people think it means. And it's a right. lot different from what people think it means. And a lot of people, that's kind of their foundation of, of what they believe their focus on 
so many peripheral issues um such as cosmology and uh you know the the archaeology of this that and the other and 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 you know they're they're occupied with all of these things that stem from uh, an actual creation story or whatever to the point where they're not seeing the heavenly right and what i'm saying is that because anytime you focus on the lesser or anytime you focus on the lower you lose sight of the upper it, it happens a whole lot less when you focus on the upper when you focus upon the upper right you're seeing things that are so far beyond the surface level that it becomes it becomes less your focus i'll put it that way it, it becomes more your focus to to continue to dig where where you're you know i'm saying it but if you're mining for gold and you keep digging gold and you keep digging gold and you come across gold and diamonds and rubies and stuff you just you you're just you you know you struck a vein you know what right. i'm saying you know right. that that's the that's the thing to continue to follow because it keeps giving and it keeps giving and it keeps giving and it keeps giving and you don't well, have to fight it and it doesn't and there, you don't have to there's no contrivance involved because the well, same I, thing could I just say one thing same thing you're doing over there could I just say one thing Robert is that um I guess I guess the point would be that people are always trying to um speak in tongues because they want people to understand what they're saying you know what I mean in the Bible people I'm not going to say what tongues is or I'll get into that conversation I'm just saying people are always trying to speak in tongues to teach other people the ways of God and in a sense, this is the ultimate way to speak in a language that every single group of people will understand. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It's a heavenly language. So regardless of if you're into cosmology or archaeology or whatever your focus is in the Bible or however you learn, this is the ultimate teaching that can teach anyone in a sense because it's a simple parabolic language. So like... In, like you said, in every single language, there's a word for water. In every single language, there's a word for bread. In every single language, there are simple terms that even a child could understand. So that's why yeah. I believe it, it is the focus that we should focus on is, is because you, you of that. You don't have to have specialized knowledge. This is one right. of those things where if you start to, if you start mining it, like I say, you start harvesting it or how you look at it, you're, you're just going on and on and on and building and building and building. Um, like what you just said about the tongues when you read, I mean, again, cause it's just, it's just the unitary thought. I keep saying this to sound like a broken record here, but I mean, I just, it's the unitary thought you go to the gospel of truth. And what does it say? It says that the, the, the mouth is the father and the tongue is the Holy spirit. So when you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking in the spirit, right? Well, it's the same thing you see in acts. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing you see there. It's just, it's the same everywhere you look. And I think when you see, if you see difficulties or if you see dissimilarities or something, you have to be able to, I think, like I said before, you have to kind of let the one thing inform the other. Sometimes it's, you know, like it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. You got two disparate stories. How do they relate? Well, I'm trying to explain is that the, the book of Genesis starts out with a teaching about the separation of the scriptures the ones that are going to be above held up in the heavens and again the book of enoch talks about this it says look uh, that this book is not for this generation but one which is for to come right, right. The, Concerning the remote the generation so right. inherent in that statement uh, jude is quoting a book barnabas is quoting a book jesus is alluding to this book peter the too the book yeah. is saying it's not for his age but for a time to come right? Mm -hmm. A scholar would say, well, he's talking about the flood, right? So God puts a foil in there and says, okay, so why, why is Jude saying that this prophecy is with reference to the people in, in, in infiltrating his church? Mm -hmm. If it was over at the time of the flood from the removal and the ungodly at that time, right? right. Why is it still relevant in Jude's age? Right. So it, he creates a conundrum, right? Well, they can't really exactly answer that question. So I feel I find that when people don't have an answer, they sweep it under the rug. And like right. I said, I don't have every answer. I can't, you know, and that's fine. Numbers aren't my strong point. There are a lot of things that, but I just feel like, look, 
it's 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 about like I said before, iron sharpening iron. There's plenty of work to go around. If, if I had all knowledge, if I had everything to do, I wouldn't have time to do it. I still got a right. nine to five. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I have <laughs> things I have to do. And I'm not, again, I'm not I'm trying to make excuses. I'm just saying I'm one person. Uh, I know. I agree right? with you. I have a nine it, to five too. I know. I know. I and it's, it. it's, it's <laughs> people out there who are listening to this, who are getting this, they need to understand that it that it's not just in here. It's it's got to come out. It's got to manifest. It's got to come out of their mouth. It's got to come out of their hands. It's got to come out of, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, like I said, one candle lights another candle and lights another candle and everybody's lighting everybody else's candle. This is how we reach critical mass. This is right. how we get to that point. You know, it's just about spreading the word. Well, you think about something that goes viral. Um, and how fast that can happen these days. If something like this were to catch on, it could literally go around the world in a day because it could. certain thi certain things, and I'm not saying it is complicated in a sense, you know what I mean? But, it, you know, we've been learning this for a long time. I've been learning from you for a long time, but to get the grasp of it, just the simple grasp of it that could open, like for you to knock on the door and walk in the door, then that's a sense you getting it. You know, then you have time to go look around the house and everything like that. You know what I'm saying? But for just to grasp it, you could figure it out in one day and you're just like, all of a sudden your candle's lit and you get it. That could happen very quickly. And in this day and time with technology, the way it is, if, if something happened where it just kept caught on all of a sudden, I would love to be here to see that. Honestly, that'd be awesome. Well, I, I'm fairly convinced that this is going to happen in our lifetimes now. I oh, mean, yeah, I, I could get run over by a train tomorrow for all I know. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm just talking about, you know, figuratively, you know, right. collectively within our yeah. lifetime. You know what I'm saying? It just it, what it really boils down to is that it's written. And the very fact that you see the first fruits of this, the very fact that, that this template that they've given us for seeing is something that's transmissible. Like, I understand. Look. There are there there are a lot of things that about this where you could say uh, I mean like I, I give you an example like when we talk about cults for example mm -hmm. a cult generally has a very strong central figure and or idea you know what I'm saying that that people just sort of believe and then they have to accept some things and reject other things and when you when you show them things in the scriptures for example they have to kind of eschew them. Um, I, you know, like for example, Michael, the archangel, right. He says that, uh, the Lord rebuke thee. Right. Mm -hmm. So if Michael, the archangel, for example, is Jesus, how is he, how is he referring to himself in the, in the second person, you know what I'm saying? Or the third person. Yes. I you know what I'm saying? So there, you know, say, so somebody has to say, Oh, well, there's something wrong with that statement. I have to negate that somehow. Or I have to I have to explain it away. You could be accused of that. We could be accused of spiritualizing everything. The the the, the thing to understand, and the thing to, to really to keep sight of, is the fact that is that this is an awareness. This is a seeing. This is a hearing, right? This is a perception, right? And I, I've deliberately gone out of my way to try and be as peripheral to this as I can be, even though it's kind of, it's kind of central to what I do. You know what I'm saying? I don't, yeah. there, I, there's this, there's no reason for this to be some kind of like, you know, fixed around any one person. You see right. what I'm saying? It never talks about it in that sense. It's always about a collective, the elect. Right. No one will be able to tell you what to see or to think or whatever. So because the spirit is going to tell you. Right. Yeah. So you're giving people essentially eyes to see and ears to hear. And like when when Jesus would hire somebody or I'm sorry, heal somebody. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes he'd give them a little bit of an instruction, you know, right. pick up your mat and walk. Right. Go and say no more. Go into more. town and tell people this. Don't go into town. Don't tell anybody <laughs> anything. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh, you get up. Oh, you, I, I just cured your fever. Here, go, go get us some. Go get us something. <laughs> start, start. start <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, he, he gave people instructions, right? So when you're lifted up from your dead state, right? Maybe, maybe there's there's a job for you. 
You know what I'm right. saying? When, when, that makes sense. when your fever has broken, maybe there's a job for you. You know what I'm saying? Maybe Jesus has things to do with you in your life now that you're awakened, right? right. Now you put your hand to the plow. You need to, you need to continue with that, right? You need to use your talents. I mean, I know some of you out there can draw. Some of you guys can write. Some of you guys can sing. Everybody's got different things they can do. You know, there's outreach, right? The point is, without a leader, without an actual figurehead, then the onus is on every single one of us. It, this is decentralized. This is every person has a direct conduit with the truth and with their heavenly father. You know what I'm saying? Every single one of us, and, and, and regardless of how we may relate to other, whatever kind of alliances, coalitions, you know, whatever agreements or whatever we enter into with other people, everyone's, everyone's true allegiance is to the truth, right? And that's, that's the whole thing. Um, it's a, it's about, it's about seeing, and it's about transcendence and a person who, like I said, you could, you could, you could, you could turn on just during the course of this video, you could come into this video without any of this knowledge, right? And you could leave this video with, you know, you, you might be squeezing, you know, rubbing your eyes or whatever, or whatever at the sunlight or whatever. It may be a little much at first, right? But to someone such as yourself who's been going at this for a real long time, right? You're pretty hardcore into this. You know, I'm talking about this and you're like, yeah, it's like this and it's like that and it's like this and it's like that and it's over here and it's over there. And I'm looking down and exactly what you're saying is right here in front of my face. That's a common experience because right. that's, how, that's how the spirit operates. You know, it makes those connections. When you're right, when you're on the right track, right, you know it, you sense it. Right. right. It, 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 it's very reaffirming and it's very reassuring in your spirit to know the truth and to be able to speak the truth and to manifest the truth. You know, if you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching this on some other venue. Right. But think about it. You have a venue. You could do this. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? There's so many platforms and so many venues. And, you know, for right now. This hasn't gotten so large that there's a big level of resistance against it, um, like they do on the political level and on the public health issues and stuff like right. that. Right. right. There may come a day when this becomes a threat to the establishment. You know, we'd like to see that happen. Right. If, if you if you know what I'm saying, I I, I think yes. the establishment is based. It the church is built on sand because because. Their house, they didn't dig deep into the scriptures. They didn't take Jude seriously. They didn't take the author of Hebrews seriously. They didn't, they didn't take those references seriously, right? And so, and so there's not a solid foundation. I don't have to back off of my claim. I don't have to back off. You know what I'm saying? I'm in a strong, solid position when it comes to this. People will say, people will say, oh, well, you can't add to or take from the work of God. Oh, you mean like when you canonized it, right? Uh, like when you when you took a book out that Jude was reading and you cast it aside. You mean like that? Uh, you know what I'm saying? People, you know what I'm saying? Every one of their arguments tends to fall flat on its face. You know what I'm saying? It said that in Deuteronomy too. So does that mean that every book after Deuteronomy is 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 bumpkiss? You don't you know that? I mean, what what are you saying? You know what I'm saying? It's it's th those arguments fall flat. Right. They don't make any sense when you think about it because they don't they're they're meant to fall. You know, what I'm saying they're me there's nothing that's built up right now on this world with this logic that isn't meant to crumble. All right. The 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 there are two there are two foundations. The one is solid. That is that is you dig down into the earth. In other words, you unearth something. You, you remove the earth from it and then you see the foundation right? Mm -hmm. It's a removal process. You dig deep. And then when the rains come and the winds come, the winds of doctrine, in other words, do not be blown around by every wind of doctrine. That means the false teachings come along. Your house is going to stand. Their house is going to fall mm -hmm. because there's nothing I have to back off on. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, like I said, I could, I could have gone through all the chapter one here with this. I, I, I'm, I'm going to give this a further treatment at some point in the near future. And people can tune into that. But that being said, um, I'm just telling you that that once you learn 
how to learn, once you see how to see, once you hear how to hear, right? Once you get how to get it, you know what I'm saying? All of these pieces will fall into the place, you know? Uh, and, and it's all set up for our edification at the end of time. You know, it's, it's a time capsule. It's a secret message and we got the decoder ring. You know what I'm saying? Right. We're reading it. We're right. seeing it. And it, the reason we know it is at a time, let's say where it could spread from one end of the earth and the other, as you said, in an instant, right? Yes. Then it's a pretty volatile situation. And it's something where, again, when it, whenever it's his timing, it will happen. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of it because there's, there's, there's no two ways about it. It's there. It, Can I read one thing, Robert, real quick? Right. Um, um, Matthew thirteen thirty three, and another parable he spake unto them. So Jesus is speaking, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took, and the woman is wisdom, and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. So the mm -hmm. kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. So the woman is the Holy Spirit, which is wisdom. And in Ecclesiasticus, which is a wisdom text written by um, Jesus, son of Sirach, which is in the Apocrypha, which was removed, that woman, she took three measures of meal and made the whole bread rise. So Jesus is the bread that rises on the third day. So notice this, before this was ever even written with numbers on it, it was 1333. So three threes right there. And in it, a woman, the Holy Spirit, which is wisdom, she hid it in three measures of meal to make the bread rise. So what rose Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit which is wisdom right here. Wisdom raises her sons to greatness and cares for those who seek her. To love her is to love life. To rise early for her sake is to be filled with joy. The man who attains her will win recognition and the Lord's blessing rests upon every place she enters. To serve her is to serve the Holy One and the Lord loves those who love her. Her dutiful servant will give laws to the heathen and because he listens to her, his home will be secure. If he trusts her, he will possess her and bequeath her to his descendants. At first, she will lead him by devious ways, filling him with craven fears. Her discipline will be a torment to him and her decrees a hard test until he trusts her with all his heart. And let me tell you that it says that in the Gospel of Thomas, which was dug up in Qumran during this century. It says that you will go through these different phases when you learn these things. It will be hard for you to believe this stuff. It'll be hard for you to understand in Genesis that what those things mean in a spiritual sense. But once you get it, you'll get all of it. And then the Jesus, the Word of God, will rise and it will under, make you understand the Christ level of what we're saying, which is what Paul talks about. So go ahead. Sorry, Robert. Well, yeah, I mean, it, that you'd be troubled, right? Right. And when you're, That's what Thomas you're says. Troubled, yes. You will be amazed because this is amazing. It, I mean, it, it's enough to pull you out of your, your slumber and it's enough to pull you out of your blindness and it's enough to pull you out of your drunkenness, so to speak. It's, it's metaphorical, metaphysical statements. Um, and they, they have very specific meanings. They, they, if you if you come to understand like it starts out whoever okay these are the secret sayings which the living jesus spoke and which judas most judas thomas wrote down and he said whoever comes to understand the interpretation of these sayings will not taste of death so it's a riddle it's a riddle okay and with the proper understanding it's not a hard riddle to unravel the 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 ease with which you can get i mean to say that that wh whoever comes to understand this stuff will not taste of death. What it means is the corollary to that is that if you don't understand what you are, what you experience is death, right? So death is 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 a state of not understanding, whereas life is a state of understanding. So when he says the living Jesus spoke, he spoke from his understanding and he spoke from his wisdom, right? And Genesis Judas Thomas wrote down what he said. But these words were somehow passed down to us, right, in their original forms. Um, that, to me, the proof is in the pudding. Um, I have posited in my mind that if I could somehow, 2,000 years later, sense what this stuff means and have this stuff revealed to me on some level, right, 
it, it, it's not impossible for somebody in the second century or the third century or the fourth century to speak out of inspiration. Mm -hmm. All right. That isn't to say that, that, that those documents are more or less reliable. I don't think it has anything to do with that. When you hear somebody speaking from that language, you know, they know the truth. When you see somebody writing according to those codes and according to those rules, right? They knew the rules. They knew the language. They spoke it. Um, Jesus or Yeshua, who was the author of Sirach, right? Um, that was his name, right? His name was Yeshua. These are the word, they call it Jesus, son of Sirach or whatever, right? So Sirach was the older one. But, uh, anyways, the the idea was that uh, that he spoke that knowing that his words were inspired mm -hmm. he knew that he had that inspiration he knew that he had that insight right so he was able to open up parables he was able to to speak mysteries you know what i'm saying and that's what that's what even the prologue says about him when it explains his backstory a little bit you know that that he had wisdom beyond his own words and that what he spoke was actually hard to convey because it was, you know, translated into the Greek or whatever, um, you know, and they didn't have the same force as he had. Of course, the, that book has been found in, in Hebrew fragments, so it existed originally, you know, in Hebrew or so it's thought. Um, but the idea is that, that, like it says in the Wisdom of Solomon, he makes profits out of people. Um, and, and, and you can know immortality. And again, um, it's not just the kind of immortality that like, oh, you were famous and you left a legacy and everybody will remember you. I mean, that's one level of it. You know, people remember Alexander the Great still dead. You could say he had like an immortal, I don't know, reputation or something. Okay, fine. But that's not him. That's just his reputation. You know what right. I'm saying? The immortality is something where literally you are a spiritual being and you, you exist from a different plane. Um, uh, again, Philip talks about this. It's not just some light, but, you know, something heavenly and something, you know, different from fire. It's, it's a spiritual fire, um, your spiritual nature, in other words. Um, when you see Moses and Elijah up on the mountain in their spiritual form, right, having transcended time and space, you know, uh, uh, to be there present across the age with the apostles, you know, um, it doesn't say that they were ghosts or projections. Or, I mean, it literally says it was right. them. So right. they saw Jesus firsthand in the spirit. They were there, right, in the spirit, speaking with him. Um, you know what I'm saying? So uh, to me, when people try to, to contextualize and they say this is earlier, this is later, this is – I don't – to me, it's less relevant than, than asking yourself, did they understand – the, the meaning were they right. writing on this level because if they were writing on this level it means that they're on the same page as we are today understanding it you know what i'm saying that they yes. understood what the apostles taught that they understood what was written in the original scriptures the reason i want to go back to genesis and explain all this is because i'm trying to show you that the scriptures were meant to be separated and held apart right and, you know, like we talked about at the, at the outset of this, this thing, it, this all started with Barnabas knowing that on the seven, the seven days represented the 7,000 years or whatever. Right. What I was going to get into was about how at that point man had had, had gotten power over the birds, the birds and the beasts of the earth and the whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, what I'm saying that is our transition on the sixth day or whatever into the seventh, which is the day of the rest. Right. right. Well, that, that's what it says in Barnabas 15 one. It says that um, and ye shall hallow the Sabbath of the Lord with pure hands and with a pure heart. Your hands are what you do and your heart is how you feel, like what you feel in your heart like, as truth, like the inside of you. So it's the inside of you and the outside of you. And the Sabbath is something that you like. It's not it's not the way people think that it is. It says of the Sabbath, he spaketh in the beginning of the creation. Barnabas 15, three. So they all of a sudden he's Barnabas is talking about Genesis of the Sabbath. He speaketh on the beginning of creation and God made the works of his hands in six days. And he ended on the seventh day and rested on it. And he hallowed it. Then he says to us, this is him speaking to us from back then. Barnabas is saying, give heed children. What, what is it? a child of seven days? That's the elect. So he's talking to us. 
mm-hmm. what this meaneth. He ended in six days. He meaneth this. And in 6,000 years, the Lord shall bring all things to an end. For the day with him signifieth a thousand years, as it says in Second Peter and in, in um, Psalms, which is David's work, for the both prophets. Behold, the day of the Lord shall be as a thousand years. Therefore, children, in six days, that is in 6,000 years, everything shall come to an end. And he rested on the seventh day. This meaneth... When his son shall come and shall abolish the time of the lawless one, which is the Antichrist, and shall mm-hmm. judge the ungodly and shall change the sun and the moon and the stars, then shall he truly rest on the seventh day. Right. Furthermore, he, he saith, thou shalt hallow it with pure hands and with a pure heart. If therefore a man is able to hallow the day which the God hallowed, that though he be pure in heart, we have gone utterly astray. So he's saying, you can't even... I'll observe the Sabbath right now, which means that a certain thing I'm not going to talk about, a certain denomination is incorrect in their theology because their theology is them mixing the mud, the dirt of the earthly teaching with Jesus's words that come out of his mouth. So that spit that they're mixing up, which is that denomination. Well, they, yeah, that's, that's, the mud is wild. Yeah. With the sow wallowing in the mud too, it's the same thing. Yeah, they thing didn't see the, purely the because they mixed it, it in the mud. Blinding them. Right. He's saying that the 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 church age um, has to do with their teachings mixed with his word, right? He's he's right. that the, the church has to do with the mud and the and the false theology, and the 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 dog has to do with the vomit. Right. Um, your new moons and your Sabbaths, I cannot away with. You see right. what is the meaning. It is not your present Sabbaths that are acceptable to me, but the Sabbath, the Sabbath which I have made. So he's telling you, you what you're doing isn't acceptable to me. It's a future thing in a spiritual sense that you're supposed to be doing. You can't do it because you're not pure yet. You haven't been bathed in the Arturzian Lake yet or whatever. You know, in the future, we will be pure. So go ahead. Sorry, and again, and a lot of this is figurative. See, the, the problem is it's not so obvious in Genesis as it is in Revelation. In Revelation, you see dragons and you see whores and you see all kinds of like, you know, stars and this and that. And you, you automatically make the inferences that the stars are angels. And then when you see the stars in Genesis, you don't make that same inference. This, this is what I'm saying. You, it, it's the same over here as it is over here as it is over here. It's the unitary knowledge. If it works over here, it's going to work over here. It's going to work over here. If it doesn't work over there, it's not going to work over here. It's not going to work over here. It isn't this and that. It's all of it. You know what I'm right. saying? It's not, it's not hit or miss. It's not yes and no. It's not pick and choose. It just is. And you have, to, and that's why you come to be at rest. You know, I'm not fighting the truth. When Jude says that he believes Enoch, I'm like, yeah, well, I believe it too. You know, when he says that it's that it's at the time of the wicked, the removal of the wicked and the ungodly, like what you just said in Barnabas, right? He was talking about the time of the removal of the wicked and the ungodly, right? Just now. This is the same thing. Enoch says, look, it's being held back for the time of the removal of the wicked and the ungodly. So if God has done this, you know what I'm saying? The problem is we're standing in our own way is what we're doing. We're, right. we're, we're fighting with something we should not be fighting with for the sake of basically the traditions of the elders. Basically, we're returning to um, the vomit, so to speak, the old teachings of the Jews where they had a canon and they set themselves up as these books are in, those books are out, right? This means this instead of that, right? And again, before we cut this, cut this short, um, I was going to say the the idea that <laughs> the idea just went clean out of my head um, that that um, that what we're seeing here is the same thing we're seeing everywhere else that that the idea is that a star and the sun and the moon the way that they're used in Revelation is really the same way that they're used in Genesis. And that's why you see so many callbacks. You're you're seeing so many parallels between those two books to begin with, right? Because Revelation is kind of the end and Genesis is kind of the beginning. And they kind of like, by the time you get through reading Revelation, it's like he was talking so much about Genesis. It makes sense to go back there and read that book again. You just have right. to read it with the same eyes. You just have to read it with the same ears as you were reading all the other books. You know, the, the stars have to do with the angels, the heavenly light, the greater light is the day the day dawns right. and the star rises in your heart that's the kingdom of light right, right. the lesser light 
that has to do with the fleshly meaning. It has to do with the the God of this world, so to speak, the right. lower God. Well, if you're if if people are spiritually dead for not understanding these things, and Jesus is the life, which is also the bread, and Matthew thirteen three said, um the woman took um you know three lumps and made the bread the bread to rise with the leaven then that's three that's three things that are in that Matthew 13 33 is three things and in mm -hmm. Matthew 7 9 it says which of you if your son asks for bread will give him a stone okay now go to Matthew 4 3 and the tempter which is Satan came to him and said if you are, are the son of God tell these stones to become bread so you have the two stones before, like uh, two stones right here in the desert. Je Satan is being tempted. I mean, S Satan is tempting Jesus. And he says to him, take these stones and make them bread. So this entire conversation that me and you have been having, Robert, is about the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the Apocrypha, which is all the books that were removed, which is Matthew 13, 33, has three stones. So he's telling them, take these stones and make them bread. So in order for it to be edible to the spirit, you need the other portions, in my opinion. You need, you need the rest of it because if, you, if, if your child asks you, it says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, would you give him a stone? So well, he's he asking you for some. Sorry, go the ahead. Bread Robert. and the true bread. The true right. bread is that which comes down from heaven. He says also, I am the true bread. He is the word of God. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, bread and stones are kind of interrelated. And then this is one of those cases where you in, you make that inference because they're used in connection with one another. How can you make stones bread, right? Right. It's because you can't eat a stone, right? You can't. That doesn't do anything for you. You know what I'm saying? You eat a stone, it's going to pass right through you. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. It's not. It's not something you can digest. All right. But the bread is something you can digest. So it's kind of like if you're just on the fleshly level understanding that's like the word itself is like or the bread itself because the bread is the word of god the word is you know whatever it, it's all goes around on itself as a matter of fact you mentioned in thomas where he says look um he he took him and spoke uh three things to him right and when he came back to his companions they asked him what did he say to you and he's like listen if i were to tell you one of the things he said to me you would pick up stones and and throw them at me and then a fire would come out of those stones and burn you up well he he's not talking literally there he's not saying right. oh my god the stones caught fire. <laughs> i mean he's talking yeah. figuratively because the right. stones the stones are the word before they're 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 edible so to speak in their in their reified concretized state the fleshly state where everything is very literal again it's like the difference between literal and literary, right? The, the magic of this, so to speak, the really powerful thing about this argument is because let's suppose that we got in a room full of atheists and people of other religions or whatever. I just to take a cross section and you could actually convince some of them to actually shut up and listen and actually, you know what I'm saying? Which is a tough thing because everybody's always so full of themselves and so sure of themselves. And they don't really right. come to the table actually wanting to know. But if I was having a, an actual argument with an intellectual, honest, intellectually honest person, right. I would always come from the literary angle. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Read, read the, I mean, look, you'll go watch Star Wars and you'll see, you'll see Yoda like pull the ship up out of the, uh, the bog or something using the force or whatever. And you can sit there and watch that and, 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 you know what I'm saying? You can, you, you can expose yourself to those things, right? So when you see in the Bible, for example, a lot of the same kind of things where, um, where, where there's power over the, the material, you know what I'm saying? I always kind yes. of feel like, I always kind of feel like in a way that the prophets and Moses and Jesus or whatever, I, I see them a little bit like, you know, like the Jedi or something like that. If you could see them as characters, what are they doing? Right. Right. If you could actually be honest with yourself and look at this and, and put aside your biases for a minute and actually look at it as literature, literature, see it right. a, on a literary basis. Right. Yes. If you could stomach it on a literary basis and you could digest a little what of what you're hearing. Right. You can begin to see that that like we spoke before of like the Wizard of Oz or whatever, having a separate higher, you know, 
parabolic meaning or whatever like that. If you just yes. afford the Bible the same, the same uh, courtesy and try right. to see it on a literary basis. When Jude is quoting Enoch, it is a literary feature within that book. So if you're an English teacher or, you know, you're studying this as literature or something like that, you can easily discern that he's making reference to an extra canonical book. And that from a literary standpoint, now you can believe it or not, you can say it's all bunk or whatever, you know, whatever. But the idea is that literarily he believes this book. He, he literarily is promoting this book as ancient. He's literarily quoting it as prophetic, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you've got that door open to speak with anybody if, right. you, if you approach it from a literary standpoint. That's why he said, look, whenever you go to, um, um, uh, to, to heal the sick or whatever, eat what they place before you and heal right. the sick among them, right? right? It means that whatever they place before you, again, the food is spiritual food. What is our spiritual food? Our spiritual food is the scriptures, right? right. So let's say you have somebody who's uh, somebody who believes that there's only 66 books in the Bible, let's say, and you start with that, right? Um, you could show them out of these 66 books, right? right? You could show them out of Genesis, you right, because I just I just did it. I just did it. Matthew thirteen thirty three. I just showed it yeah. with the, with the canon. So that's the so eating what they give you. The spiritually sick among them, based upon what they already accept. Right? right. That's the power of the literary argument. You know what I'm saying? You don't you don't have to prove this by geography. You don't have to prove this by um, linguistics or something. You know, they, 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 there's so many there's so many like side issues and stuff. This is very central. You know, again, this is, this is very, um, that's why you focus on this though, because it's the, it's the one thing it's the one that can thing. prove all of them wrong. Like basically, yeah, because you, don't have to, you don't even have to leave your house to follow right, the logic. Right, right. You know, right, you don't right. have to go to the edge of the world and take a picture of it to prove this. You know what I'm saying? Right. You can open up that book and it literally says the seventh from Adam. He thinks it's ancient. Okay. You're an atheist. You can realize that from a literary standpoint, Jude thinks it's ancient, right? Uh, if you're some other religion, from a literary standpoint, you can say, you can see that his assertion is that it's prophetic. Right. You may not believe it, but that's his assertion, literarily, right? So, that, I mean, that's, that's the strength of this argument, is that, is that it's, it's a wisdom. Uh, he says this literally, I will give you a mouth and a wisdom that no one will be able to, to gainsay. You know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's the double-edged sword that comes out of his mouth because like, the, like the, the, the spit that makes the guy see, the sword comes out of Jesus' mouth too. And it's the sword that goes forwards and backwards. So it's double-edged. So it cuts back through time and that's, forward through time. That's the nature of prophecy. Prophecy conceals in prospect. It hides right. things in, in parables, in prospect. It hides things under the earthly veneer. You know, and, and you see just the surface of the deep of the waters, so to speak. And the spirit hovers upon that, right, makes it come alive. But right. the idea, the idea here is that um, the literary argument transcends belief and unbelief. The fact right. is that, that Jude, the literary feature of this book is that he's quoting books outside the Bible. So any conception that the canon is something real is undermined by the thing that's in the canon. So right. if you can get people by means of the canon to say, look, he's quoting uh, Maccabees over here. Uh, he's quoting uh, the, the martyrdom of Isaiah over here. He's quoting Enoch over here. And, and, and don't overlook the fact that all throughout the Old Testament, it's like, you know, this is in Edo, this is in Jasher. They're specifically naming all of these books that are outside of the canon. Right. Yes. So the idea is that every church and every doctrine that's based on this idea of a canon, a closed yes. canon, is temporary. They have borrowed the name at interest. And at some point, they'll have to pay it back because they won't have that title anymore. They won't be known for being the bastion of the truth when it's exposed that their foundation is sand. Mm -hmm. Right. That they have no foundation, that the whole and thing crumbles underneath them. And that's the whole point. The ax is laid at the roots of these particular trees, so to speak. These teachings are vulnerable. These teachings are 
um, temporal, right? They are up to the time of the removal of the wicked and the ungodly, right? And that's where we are now. Because at the point at which we have the open door, like I said, that's the Church of Philadelphia transitioning, you know, and appealing to the, the church at Laodicea. That's going from the sixth church or the sixth, you know, portion of that age into the seventh final portion of the age where the Laodiceans are at long last. And they have that open door. He's like, listen, whoever comes through this door, whoever I stand at the door and knock, whoever comes through. I will eat with him and he will eat with me. And again, this is spiritual food. This is spiritual eating. So in other words, it's, it's again, it's the feast. It's the meal right. of his word that he's going to eat with them. So they have to overcome their, the, the fact that they're so fat and happy and complacent and realize that they're not clothed with his spirit. They're not clothed with the truth. They're actually naked and poor and destitute and, and ill and all of this. So, you know what I'm saying? They're in bad shape, right? Yes. And they don't see it. They don't know it. We have to show it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Robert. I really appreciate the time tonight uh, to go over all of this. And um, I know you are uh, you probably have to go. It's been about two hours, I think, that we've done the show. I can't tell from looking at it. But um, I'd love to do another follow-up. I know that maybe uh, possibly you would want to do a show on Genesis on your own because you do like doing those shows as well. But if we get a chance to, to go further in Genesis, I think that would be awesome. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know when it was officially uh, when it officially happened, um, this book that I have I share on my channel as well tells you that um, in 1885, um, Westcott and Hort removed the apocrypha, the 14 books of the apocrypha, officially from the regular canon, and it's it, that has happened. Um, you know, those types of things have have happened to God's word many times throughout the course of history since Jesus died, and and that is represented by Peter's denials of Christ. Um, when the, the, the three times that that happened. So um, in my opinion, we're, I don't know about Robert, but in my opinion, we're the fig tree generation, um, 1948, and we have 70 years plus maybe 10 by, if by strength, as it says in the Bible. And so that's why me and Robert are having this conversation right now is because th this is the time of the end. Who knows how much more time we have left. But in my opinion, that's why um, Enoch, you know, prophesied that these things would come to pass at this time, at this late hour. So um, God bless. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do another show soon. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll share everything we've done together uh, today. And uh, I hope everybody has benefited from that. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you.